17-year-old Rudy Farias was reported missing by his mother in 2015, adding to a series of family tragedies. In 2011, Rudy witnessed his brother's death in a car accident, and in 2014, his father took his own life. When Rudy disappeared, it seemed like another misfortune had befallen the family. However, on June 29, 2023, Rudy was found alive. Investigators soon discovered that Rudy had never actually been missing. He had been living at home with his mother the entire time. He had even spoken to police over the years using a fake name. This case has raised many questions. Why did his mother report him missing? What was Rudy doing during those eight years? Why did he use a false identity? And why did it take so long for the truth to come out? Rudolph Farias, known to everyone as Rudy, was born in Houston, Texas. He lived with his mother, Janie Santana, and his older brother, Charles, who was from Janie's previous relationship. Janie had been married to another man for 10 years. Rudy's father, also named Rudolph Farias, was a veteran officer from the Houston police who remained distant, having another family with five more children. For Rudy, his older brother was a crucial figure in his upbringing. Rudy once shared on Facebook how important Charles was to him. He recounted how, during his time at school, he was often teased for being small and skinny. But whenever things got tough, Charles would step in to defend and protect him. Charles was more than just a brother. He was Rudy's best friend and father figure. However, Rudy sometimes felt a tinge of jealousy because Charles had a good relationship with his father, who often visited and took Charles out, bringing back cool toys or Happy Meal surprises from McDonald's. According to Rudy, Charles noticed his sadness and one day talked to him, acknowledging Rudy's hurt over not seeing his father. Charles promised he would always be there for Rudy and never abandon him. The brothers grew up inseparable, relying on each other under the strict and unstable supervision of their mother, Janie. To explain Janie's instability, judicial records show she had used at least five different surnames over the years, including Diaz, Rodriguez, Farias, and Ortega. The records also indicate that Jenny had been married several times, with at least one marriage annulled because one of her ex-partners claimed she was married to two other people simultaneously. She also had a history of minor criminal offenses, such as public disorder on November 22, 1994, inappropriate conduct with a loaded firearm in 1996, and driving without a license with a minor presumed to be Rudy in 2020. Additionally, she had been arrested for speeding and driving under the influence. Janie also created social media accounts on platforms like TikTok and Facebook using photos that were not hers. According to different sources, Janie once stole pictures of a country singer to use on a fake profile. Despite the tumultuous household, there was always pride for the eldest son, Charles. He benefited from his father's financial support, but remained humble and down to earth. Charles was an excellent brother, son, and student. He graduated from high school in 2007 and was accepted into the U.S. Marine Corps, with training set to begin on March 21, 2011. At 21, Charles dreamed of serving his country but his life was tragically cut short in a motorcycle accident on February 13, 2011. Charles's sudden and tragic death profoundly impacted the family. Rudy, who was 13 at the time, expressed his grief on Facebook, detailing the events of that fateful day. He recounted how they woke up together that morning, and Charles asked Rudy to help him get the motorcycle out of the garage. After preparing, Charles left to meet friends, marking the last time Rudy saw his brother alive. A family friend called later that day to inform them that Charles had been in an accident and his body was lying on the pavement. Rudy and Janie rushed to the scene. Rudy recalled that at first, he couldn't see his brother. Then he saw his mother on the ground, 
holding Charles and pleading with God to bring her son back. Rudy described how he froze, staring at his brother lifeless on the ground. This state of shock stayed with him for a long time. He told his loved ones that he found it difficult to even say the word death. He preferred to think that his brother had fallen asleep forever and often said he would soon meet Charles in heaven. At Charles's military funeral, Rudy delivered an emotional speech expressing how much he would miss his brother, who was the closest thing he had to a father. He shared that Charles taught him many things, but not how to live without him. The following years were tough for Janie and Rudy. The void left by Charles was a heavy burden to bear. Rudy began experiencing recurrent episodes of post-traumatic stress and depression. He even started self-harming, scratching his wrists with sharp objects like aluminum cans. On August 19, 2014, three years after his brother's death, Rudy received news that his father, aged 51, had also died tragically. The lifeless body of Rudy's father was found in his uniform inside his patrol car. He had parked in a secluded area outside Houston, where he decided to take his own life using his service weapon. The police report on the incident revealed that shortly before, he had been relieved of his duties pending an internal affairs investigation. Rudolph had been with the Houston Police Department since May 1993. A police spokesperson detailed that Rudolph was placed on administrative leave pending the investigation into criminal conduct allegations. The suspension meant he had no police duties and was assigned closely supervised desk work with little to no public contact. It is noteworthy that Rudolph was one of four officers under investigation for manipulating speeding tickets issued by the Houston Police Department's Traffic Enforcement Unit. There were instances, for example, of tickets being issued at the same time in different locations hundreds of miles apart. There were also questionable tickets issued late at night. Police sources explain that the motive behind these irregularities was to commit fraud to earn overtime pay. Records show that Rudolph earned $158,000 in overtime since 2012. Although Rudolph was an absent figure, his death affected Rudy, who once again expressed his feelings on Facebook. He thanked those who sent condolences for his father, even though he had never known him. Rudy acknowledged feeling pain because his father's death permanently closed any possibility of a father-son relationship. He confessed that he never expected to feel anything for his father, but in the end, he experienced pain, sadness, lethargy, and other confusing emotions. Amid the emotional turmoil on March 6, 2015, Rudy left his house around 6 p.m. to walk his two dogs in northwest Houston. A few hours later, one of the dogs returned home. The second dog came back the next morning, according to a police report. On March 7, 2015, Rudy's mother reported him missing. A missing persons flyer from that year noted that Rudy had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety, and that he might have stopped taking his prescribed medication. The flyer described Rudy as having suffered a leg injury that caused a slight limp. Rudy's cousin told the New York Post that although Rudy was 17, his mental age was around 10. Some of Rudy's family speculated that he might have been kidnapped and sold into a human trafficking ring. Two years after his disappearance in May 2017, authorities put up a billboard in North Houston to draw attention from local residents in hopes that someone might provide clues to find him. On March 22, 2015, a GoFundMe campaign was launched to help Janie in her search for her son, Rudy. At the time, she claimed Rudy had physical and mental disabilities. The campaign raised $2,025. In 2017, Janie told a news channel that detectives had informed her Rudy might have been kidnapped and sold to human traffickers. 
However, the case grew more perplexing as sightings of Rudy were reported between 2018 and 2022. In 2018, another of Rudy's cousins called Houston Police, saying she had seen Rudy at Janie's house. However, when officers arrived, they found no sign of him. She also mentioned that her grandmother often said she talked to Rudy, but as she was elderly, her claims were not taken seriously. The grandmother insisted that Rudy walked around the house. During a 2020 dispute over the grandmother's guardianship, Janie's sisters accused her of forcing their mother to live in a poorly maintained house. They wanted to move the elderly woman to another home because the current one was so run down that she slept on the couch as there was no bed. Additionally, the sisters alleged that the house was filled with animal urine and feces, causing the grandmother to suffer from skin infections. Despite Janie's denials, the grandmother continued to tell the family she saw and spoke to Rudy. Around the same time, neighbors began reporting seeing a young man resembling Rudy entering and leaving Janie's house. A detective from the Houston Police Department's Missing Persons Unit said that when Janie was questioned about the young man visiting her house, she claimed he was her nephew, not her son. On June 29, 2023, Around 10 p.m., a person found Rudy severely injured outside a church in southeast Houston. The young man had bruises all over his body, especially on his face. On July 3, 2023, Janie issued a statement thanking the media and the public for their support over the years. She announced that her son Rudy had been found after being missing for eight years. Janie mentioned that she had no additional information at that moment but confirmed that Rudy was found unconscious and that the police and 911 were immediately notified. She assured everyone that Rudy was receiving the necessary care to overcome his trauma but noted that he could not communicate verbally and requested privacy during this difficult time. Adding to the dramatic turn of events, Janie mentioned that Rudy was found clutching the chain his brother Charles used to wear around his neck. She later shared a photo of Rudy in a hospital bed. Rudy's aunts, however, disputed the authenticity of the photo, stating it was taken in 2012. On July 5, 2023, Rudy and his mother met with detectives from the Houston Police Department's Missing Persons Unit at a hotel. They were joined by Quinnell X, a prominent activist and advisor for the local Black Panther movement. After the meeting, Quinnell X told the media that Rudy had confided in him about experiencing oppressive practices and significant suffering over the past eight years. He suggested that Janie should be investigated and possibly detained as Rudy, now 25, had endured uncomfortable situations implying a degree of intimacy but did not label them as sexual in nature. Quinnell X informed the press that Rudy had been found outside the church because he had taken his mother's car to escape, but ended up crashing it. He also mentioned that Rudy had been visiting neighbors under an alias. Following the press conference, Quinnell X retracted his statements in an interview with The Independent, accusing the police of attempting a cover-up. He recommended providing Rudy with medical and psychological help. A video of Janie in front of her house surfaced on social media, where she expressed that she expected to be arrested. The video was recorded by local residents. On July 6, 2023, the police held their first press conference since Rudy was found. They confirmed that Rudy had returned home the day after being reported missing in 2015 and that his mother had misled the police by continuing to claim he was missing, asserting that the person seen by friends and family around the house was a nephew. The police explained that the district attorney had declined to press charges at that time since being missing is not a crime. That same day, Rudy's aunt reported that she had met with her nephew. She stated that Rudy was traumatized, did not want to be near his mother, and was staying with family friends. 
She called her sister Janie a pathological liar who had mistreated their mother, who had since passed away. She recalled how their late mother always insisted that Rudy was living in the house, only to be dismissed as lying by Janie. Learning that Rudy had been alive and controlled by his mother for eight years, his cousin told a reporter that she felt more concern than relief. She found it disturbing that Janie had lied and hidden her adult son for eight years for reasons that remained unclear. As more details of the case emerged, reporters found Janie's address and started arriving in her neighborhood. Janie became nervous and began offering money to residents, asking them to stay silent and not reveal that they had seen a young man entering and leaving the house when detectives and journalists arrived. Disturbed neighbors pointed out that the young man they now identify as Rudy had always been known to them as Doff, Janie's nephew. Amid the media frenzy and the community's astonishment at the bizarre case, Janie's whereabouts remain unknown as she appears to have left her family home. A news media confirmed that activists and neighbors gathered on July 7th in front of Rudy's house in East Houston demanding a thorough investigation by the district attorney and criminal charges against Rudy's mother. On July 13th, Rudy made his first public statements after spending eight years hidden away due to his mother's actions, attracting worldwide attention. He explained how he stayed out of sight for so long out of obedience. Rudy agreed to the on-camera interview but asked to have his face concealed because he felt overwhelmed by the attention his case had generated. He accused his mother, Janie, of brainwashing him, clarifying that he was never physically locked up or tied down. He could come and go as he pleased, but chose not to because she convinced him the world was a hostile place and they could only survive by staying together at home. The police added that although Rudy was listed as a missing person, he and his mother interacted with officers using false names and birthdays to hide their identities. During the interview, Rudy described feeling trapped in his own home for years, likening it to living in a prison. He recounted how Janie would lock him in a room whenever family members visited. He could hear them chatting and laughing but could not join in. Rudy shared that he eventually began to yearn for freedom to have a job, live a life, love someone, and be loved. He fought to understand his emotions. Janie manipulated him into believing he had to stay silent for his own good, bombarding him with negative thoughts that made him complicit in the charade. It was a form of mental imprisonment, Rudy explained as he could work with his mother as a security guard and roam the neighborhood, but always under her watchful eye. Following his reappearance in contact with people who clarified the situation, Rudy said his relationship with his mother felt like Stockholm Syndrome. This psychological coping mechanism involves victims developing positive feelings towards their captor to survive. Rudy expressed that his mother had psychologically imprisoned him and wielded significant power over him as his sole parental figure since childhood, alongside his late brother. Despite answering all the reporter's questions about his false disappearance, some of Rudy's explanations still leave gaps. For instance, when asked if he ever questioned Janie about why they kept pretending he was missing, he said he did not remember. Regarding the allegations by activist Quinnell X about inappropriate advances by his mother, Rudy stated that the media had twisted his words. He mentioned occasionally sleeping with his mother but did not recall why, asserting it was not intimate, though he felt uncomfortable with it. Reporters also asked if his mother had ever drugged him. Rudy recalled an incident when he was about 12 years old and she gave him a bottle of Tylenol PM or sleeping pills. According to Rudy, his mother forced him to go to the hospital, making him pretend he was sick from an overdose. He couldn't remember why she did this, but suggested it might have been because she had something to do at school. He added that around the time of his supposed disappearance, 
He didn't know how to handle his emotions, especially since it happened right after his brother, Charles, passed away. When asked if his mother wanted him to take on a husband-like role at home, he said yes, but only in terms of shared responsibilities, like cooking and cleaning, with nothing romantic or intimate involved. Rudy told the reporters that he finally decided to leave home because he wanted to end the life he was living, where his mother kept him hidden, manipulated him, and made him believe the outside world was dangerous. When asked what message he would send to his mother if she saw the interview, Rudy replied that he wanted her to leave him alone and let him live his life and be happy. Throughout the interview, Rudy's tone was marked by anxiety and distress. In response to Rudy's shocking and unexpected revelations, his Aunt Pauline spoke to the media, expressing her deep concern for her nephew and noting that Rudy was still scared. Janie's whereabouts remain unknown, but it's possible she will face legal action from GoFundMe for benefiting from the false disappearance story. The fundraising platform stated that she had been permanently banned from GoFundMe and future beneficiary opportunities after the scam came to light. GoFundMe has a zero-tolerance policy for misuse of the platform and cooperates with police investigations into alleged misconduct. The GoFundMe campaign claimed Janie was a single mother who lost her eldest son in 2011 and Rudy's father in 2014. She needed financial help as she couldn't work due to dedicating herself to searching for her missing son. Consequently, bills were piling up and her health had deteriorated mentally, physically, and emotionally. Brenda Paradise, a private investigator who worked on the case, believes resources were misused in the search for Rudy. Brenda is part of the nonprofit organization We Help the Missing. She mentioned that volunteers searched wooded areas and made exhaustive efforts to find Rudy. She shared some of her audio notes from 2015, where Janie accused a gang of Mexicans of kidnapping her son, but this alleged group never contacted her. Brenda has not ruled out filing a lawsuit for the expenses incurred by the association during Rudy's eight-year disappearance. Rudy's case highlights the vulnerability of minors under negligent or abusive parents. In 2018, approximately 9.2 out of every 1,000 children in the United States were subjected to some form of maltreatment, according to the Children's Bureau. Neglect is the most common form of maltreatment, present in 60% of cases, as reported by the same bureau. Neglect occurs when a parent or guardian fails to meet a child's basic needs, whether medical, educational, physical, or emotional. The combination of oppression and deprivation of liberty seen in Rudy's case is common in situations involving Stockholm Syndrome within controlling relationships. One way these feelings and thoughts develop is through cognitive dissonance, which explains how and why people change their ideas and opinions to endure situations that don't seem healthy, positive, or normal. Ali Kostiel was born in St. Louis, Missouri, but she always dreamed of attending the University of Mississippi. When she finally got this opportunity, she felt like her life had reached its peak. However, things took a dark turn. Investigators noted that no clues or evidence could have alerted Ali's friends before her life was tragically cut short on that fateful July afternoon. Detectives arriving at the crime scene were baffled by how someone could commit such an act against a well-behaved, easygoing student. Their attention quickly turned to their prime suspect, another student with a hidden agenda that no one could have anticipated. Alexandria Costiel was born on September 11, 1997, in St. Louis, Missouri. Her long name was quickly shortened to the affectionate nickname Ali which is what her loved ones always called her. 
Ali was the daughter of Cindy and Keith Costule, and she had a younger brother named Andrew. From an early age, Ali showed a strong sense of responsibility towards her studies, coupled with her athletic talents. These attributes helped her excel as a standout student at high school. In addition to her academic success, Ali was an active cheerleader, part of the track and field team, the golf team, and a member of the National Honor Society. Her adventurous spirit also led her to volunteer in Peru and Africa, where she taught English to young children. Cindy and Keith were extremely proud of their daughter, as Ali's affection and light touched everyone around her. She loved animals and children, often working as a babysitter to earn some money, and her caring nature made her a favorite among families. Ali also enjoyed dog walking and was an enthusiast of yoga and half marathon running. Her spiritual nature and constant smile made her approachable to everyone. During this period of her life, she formed a deep bond with Maddie Norris. The two became inseparable, sharing dreams and secrets in a way that felt like they had known each other in previous lives. Their friendship was more like a sisterhood, leading to many shared adventures. After graduating in 2016, Allie enrolled at the University of Mississippi to study business administration. She was thrilled to be part of an institution rich in tradition, history, and football. Her parents witnessed the excitement and joy this new chapter brought to her life. Allie also dreamed of meeting a charming Southern boy with whom she could one day start a family. Despite the distance, her friendship with Maddie remained as strong as ever. It was no surprise to her loved ones that Allie thrived not only academically but also socially. She quickly made new, meaningful friendships, including one with Elizabeth whom she met at a campus party. They shared several common interests which solidified their close bond. Among the new people in her life, one stood out as particularly special to Allie, driven by her innocent romantic aspirations. She set her sights on Brandon Thiesfeld, a young man just a year older than her from Fort Worth, Texas. Brandon was the son of Daniel Thiesfeld, a medical professional. Brandon enjoyed an idyllic childhood filled with love and all the comforts any child could wish for. Raised in a good Christian family, he had ample opportunities for outdoor activities like hunting and fishing in the vast Texan landscape. As he grew older, he also shone as a football player at his school. Like Allie, Brandon was a student at the University of Mississippi's business school. They shared mutual acquaintances and even attended some classes together. However, Brandon's temperament was quite different from Allie's. But as the saying goes, opposites attract. According to local records, Brandon was arrested in April 2017 for public intoxication and possessing a fake ID. This wasn't his only brush with the law. He was involved in another incident, though the Oxford Police Department later confirmed that the records of this case were expunged and sealed. Despite these isolated incidents and the generally good conduct Brandon displayed, there was someone who did not find him particularly likable and had reasons for such a perception. Rex Ravita, another student who lived in a dormitory across the hall from Brandon during their freshman year, frequently encountered him. Rex found Brandon's behavior objectionable, considering him a spoiled daddy's boy. According to Rex, Brandon often boasted about his father's wealth and how it could get him out of any trouble, which Rex found particularly annoying. Additionally, Rex had noticed another particularly unpleasant trait in Brandon. He often treated women in a degrading manner. One night when Allie and Brandon crossed paths at a local bar, she felt an immediate attraction. It didn't take long for them to start dating occasionally, though Allie wished they spent more time together. She often brought him along as her date to most of her parties. However, to almost everyone observing their developing relationship, it was clear that Brandon wasn't as enamored with Allie as she was with him. Despite this, 
Allie seemed blinded by her initial impression and Brandon's good looks, never seeing through the facade. The evident disinterest from Brandon and his flaws, which were apparent to everyone else, went unnoticed by Allie. She was convinced she had found her dream man and envisioned a future with a home and family. As weeks and months passed, their relationship grew complicated. Around their second year in college, driven by her intense feelings, Allie sent Brandon numerous late-night texts while she was out partying, eager to chat with him. Without any explanation, he blocked her number. During this time, Maddie visited Oxford to see her friend and unofficial sister. Naturally, she was excited to meet the new man in Allie's life, but to her surprise, Brandon didn't show up. During that visit, Maddie became concerned about Brandon's clear detachment, despite the affection Allie lavished on him. Despite this, Allie seemed to be doing well in many other areas of her life. By her third year, she had formed a strong friendship with another university student named Morgan. It was around this time that Brandon inexplicably reappeared as if nothing had happened, seeking to reconnect with Allie. Allie interpreted this gesture as a sign of mutual romantic interest and became filled with hope. However, she was the only one who saw it that way. To everyone else, it was strange, knowing that Brandon had no genuine feelings for her. One of the most astonished by the situation was Rex. Upon learning about the supposed romance between Allie and Brandon, he believed that the young Texan was emotionally manipulating her, making her think he loved her. Something Rex was sure was false. Deep down, Allie might have been aware of Brandon's lack of affection. This could explain why her closest friends and even her parents knew very little about him. References to Brandon and their relationship were quite vague. Consequently, none of Allie's close ones were aware of the emotional abuse she was experiencing. Allie often found herself in tears over the man she loved. Her roommate at the time occasionally noticed the sadness in Allie's eyes. However, as she mentioned in a later interview, Allie was a girl who radiated pure light and had the ability to appear happy even when she was sad. According to her, Allie's kindness blinded her to others' malice, making her see people as better than they actually were. In April 2019, Allie told Brandon that she was worried she might be pregnant and sent him a picture of a home pregnancy test. The results were inconclusive, but given the gravity of the situation, Allie expressed her desire to discuss it in person. Brandon's immediate response was like a cold shower. He bluntly stated he had no intention of staying with her if she was indeed pregnant. Over the next three months, Allie tried to meet with him to talk about it, but Brandon avoided her at all costs. Sometimes he would agree to meet and then cancel at the last minute. Other times, he simply wouldn't show up and offered no explanation afterward. Amid this emotional roller coaster, Allie continued with her life, hoping the situation would improve, and only communicated with Brandon electronically. Unbeknownst to her, Brandon was spending long hours trying to find a solution to what he saw as a major problem. He spent days researching online about medications and clinics for terminating a pregnancy. Unsatisfied with these options, he even considered more extreme scenarios, looking up how to use a weapon and hide a crime. In the midst of the uncertainty about their relationship status, the vacation period arrived. Allie decided not to travel back home to Missouri. Given that she was in her final year and had high academic ambitions, she chose to stay at the university in July to attend a summer course. Additionally, she was teaching fitness classes at the time, which motivated her to sacrifice her break to earn extra money for her expenses. However, Cindy and Keith were not willing to miss the opportunity to be with their daughter. They informed her that they would come to visit. Allie was overjoyed at the news. 
Once her parents arrived at her apartment, the three of them had the most wonderful days together. Allie and her mother went shopping and chatted endlessly about countless things. There was so much to catch up on that the hours seemed too short. Knowing Allie's love for the sea and the beach, Cindy gifted her several new items, all with a marine theme, to reflect her interest in her home. Allie, in turn, repeatedly asked her mother to cook her favorite dishes. When it was time to say goodbye in mid-July 2019, Allie wished her parents could stay for at least one more day. As Cindy and Keith headed back home, they comforted themselves with the thought that their next reunion was just around the corner and they just needed to be patient. Shortly after, Brandon contacted Allie via text message. Just as he had done previously, disappearing and reappearing months later as if nothing had happened, this time he requested a meeting to discuss the delicate matter in person. On Friday, July 19, 2019, back in St. Louis, Cindy called her daughter to confirm everything was all right. True to her word, Allie went to a bar that night. A while later, surveillance cameras captured her leaving the place, wearing a white shirt and blue shorts, with her head down, seemingly texting. The footage shows her in front of the door, though she doesn't enter the establishment. Afterward, Allie returned home but left again without her roommate's hearing. Around midnight, she finally met up with Brandon. The details of what transpired next have been elusive to the authorities. No one knows what was said or the tone of their conversation. It's assumed there were accusations and clarifications, but this remains speculative. What is certain is that Allie and Brandon met face to face at a lake, a vast area surrounded by numerous campsites and recreational spaces. Due to its size and characteristics, the Sheriff's Department has long patrolled its various nooks and crannies. During the early hours of Saturday, July 20th, 2019, the moonlight was the only illumination for the patrolling officers. The prevailing darkness was far from romantic. According to police sources, a local resident walking their dog reported hearing gunshots in the early hours of that morning, between 2.15 and 2.30 a.m. The attacker fled the scene. Around 10.30 a.m., a police investigator was on patrol, not expecting to discover the lifeless body of a young woman. The discovery occurred near an abandoned fishing camp, a remote location about 20 miles from the university. Overcoming the initial shock, the police officer was able to gather some general information about the victim. This experience marked a significant turning point in his career. Allie's purse, containing her school ID and driver's license, was found nearby shortly afterward. When the police department was notified, investigators began their efforts to uncover what had happened. They attempted to trace Allie's cell phone but were unsuccessful. Meanwhile, that Saturday, Brandon spent the day with friends, behaving as if it were any other day, showing no apparent signs of distress. They went bowling and chatted normally, with none of his friends noticing anything unusual. At some point between Saturday and Sunday, Brandon wrote a letter to his parents, revealing his anguish over his actions. Though he avoided explicitly mentioning the crime, he confessed to something terrible that would likely result in his imprisonment or death. He was certain that sooner or later, the police would catch him. As investigators delved into Allie's social circle, Brandon emerged as a potential suspect. The team focused their efforts on trying to contact him, but all calls to his cell phone went unanswered. On Saturday afternoon, the police visited Allie's family to deliver the devastating news. The words hung in the air, creating a surreal sense that they were living a nightmare. Overwhelmed with grief, Cindy and Keith had to face an unimaginable reality. Allie's close friend Maddie struggled to make sense of what had happened. Her mind flooded with memories of the time spent with the friend she considered a sister. Meanwhile, the police continued their attempts to reach Brandon. By then, he had left his friend's house and was driving his truck. 
Ali's cell phone remained missing. The news of the crime shocked the university community and local residents. However, due to the ongoing investigation, the police withheld further details. As a result, it was unclear whether the attacker had killed Ali at the lake or abandoned her there afterward. The same confusion surrounded the murder weapon and the connection between the victim and the perpetrator. This changed when investigators made a crucial discovery. In Ali's room, they found her smartwatch, which turned out to be an invaluable piece of evidence. The smartwatch allowed them to uncover some of the text messages exchanged between Ali and Brandon. Realizing the urgency, the team immediately tried to contact Brandon, who this time answered their call. He apologized for not responding earlier and made excuses to avoid meeting with the officers, but promised to come to the police department first thing on Monday, July 22nd. After hanging up, fully aware of his predicament, Brandon continued to travel as far as possible. On Sunday, July 21st, 2019, he arrived at another friend's house carrying an unusual item, a firearm. He made no effort to hide it and even unloaded it in front of his host. Brandon also brought a six-pack of beer, so they sat down to drink, chat, and watch television. The next morning, he left without attending the scheduled meeting at the police department, thus becoming a fugitive. Detectives obtained an arrest warrant and began tracking Brandon's phone. Having left Mississippi, Brandon's location was soon identified as Memphis, Tennessee. Authorities issued an alert for his truck, which had a distinctive license plate. It didn't take long for the Memphis Fugitive Task Force to get a positive result. About an hour and a half later, the prime suspect, wearing a blood-stained shirt, was apprehended outside a gas station in the southwest part of the state. The operation involved at least 12 officers and seven police patrols. Inside the vehicle, they found a firearm matching the one used in Alley's murder. Mississippi investigators were promptly notified. They headed north to pick up Brandon. Upon arrival, he found Brandon calm. He read him his rights and then transported the suspect back to Mississippi in custody. Once they reached the station, Brandon recounted his activities during the weekend of the crime, revealing that he had been roaming around Oxford from Friday to Saturday. Beyond that information, Brandon remained steadfast in his right to remain silent, refusing to provide further details to the investigators. He was detained at the county jail, and his family soon hired an attorney to handle his defense. In a statement, Brandon's father insisted that his son was not involved in the incident. He urged everyone to presume Brandon's innocence, confident that the ongoing investigation would reveal what he believed to be the truth. However, he was unprepared for what was to come. The first blow came when a university spokesperson confirmed that Brandon was suspended from the institution. Meanwhile, Allie's autopsy revealed that she was not pregnant at the time of her death, but this information was not shared with the media. Allie's funeral took place on Saturday, July 27, 2019. Friends, family, and community members left flowers and condolence notes. Despite their indescribable grief, they felt fortunate to have known such a vibrant and luminous young woman. In August of that year, Brandon was charged with first-degree murder. If found guilty, he could face the death penalty. His name made headlines. When Rex heard the news, he was initially shocked, but soon, everything seemed to make sense. He recalled all the rude and contemptuous comments Brandon had made about various women. For the prosecutors, the case became a textbook example of ignored warning signs in relationships that can lead to tragic endings. They believed that Allie's death could have been prevented. As the search for evidence continued, investigators discovered the letter Brandon had written during that weekend while searching his apartment. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed the start of the judicial process, 
requiring extra patience from Ali's friends and family. However, the investigators used this time to continue their work, sifting through hundreds of text messages between Ali and Brandon, a daunting task. Meanwhile, the prosecutors continued to build their case, gradually uncovering the details of an unequal love story. A series of facts, previously unknown to those close to the university student, came to light. When the case was finally presented to a grand jury in mid-2021, the evidence included photographs of the gun and bullet casings, as well as the letter. To the prosecutors, this letter was clearly a confession. However, the defense presented a completely different perspective. As Brandon pleaded not guilty, his lawyer argued that the letter was merely a farewell note, as Brandon had contemplated taking his own life at that time. To support this claim, the defense mentioned that Brandon himself had stated he was holding the gun to his head when he suddenly fainted. It was during this moment that the courtroom learned from Allie's autopsy report that she was not pregnant and had no evidence of ever having been pregnant. The revelation caused an unmistakable shock. The trial proceeded until, unexpectedly, in August 2021, just a week before the sentencing, Brandon chose to admit his responsibility for the crime. He and his legal team reached a plea agreement with the prosecution to avoid the death penalty. Instead, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. During the sentencing hearing, Brandon addressed Allie's family, apologizing for the immense pain he caused by taking their daughter's life. He acknowledged that his actions had permanently altered the lives of the Coastal family and his own. He expressed a desire to turn back time and undo his actions, but knowing that was impossible, he sought forgiveness from God and hoped that one day they might find it in their hearts to forgive him. Following Brandon's statement, the victim impact statement was read aloud in court, delivered by Cindy, Allie's mother. In her letter, she expressed regret for not being able to keep her daughter away from Brandon, whom she described in stark terms as a monstrous, heartless, scheming, ungrateful, sinister, violent, and corrupt individual. Cindy also added that Brandon had every opportunity to do good in the world, but chose to do evil. Because of that choice, he would spend every day of the rest of his life in prison. She reminded everyone that it was an atrocious act he committed against a sweet soul like Allie and predicted that every time the cell door slammed shut, it would be a reminder of what he did and the life he took. Those who knew Ali hold on to the certainty that the actions of her attacker will never extinguish the sweet light she brought into the world. On the contrary, they know that her spirit will live on through the lives she touched, as Ali always strived to make the world a better place with every step she took. If you know that, that's the reason you didn't tell Because you knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but at the same sense, there's only so much you can do. And I, I just feel like, I, I don't know, I didn't know what to do anymore. You said earlier. I, I love her to death, and I, I didn't want to watch her anymore being miserable, but I didn't want to let go of her at the same time. I went both Were you ways. with her the night before the death? Yeah. Because you said earlier, about six minutes ago, that you knew she drank a bottle the night before. Yeah. She drank, uh, not a bottle, but she put it in her vodka. I did know that. I said that yesterday. Lynn Hernan was born in June 1956 in Madison, the capital of Wisconsin, USA. She was the only daughter of Lorraine and Robert Hernan. Her arrival was a joyous and significant event for the newlyweds. Robert, a World War II veteran, had started his own plumbing business upon returning to the United States, while Lorraine was involved in real estate sales. Their stable financial situation allowed them to provide Lynn with abundant opportunities. Robert and Lorraine were known for their warmth, 
and their home was always filled with joy and the company of friends and loved ones. It was no surprise that Lynn, from a young age, exhibited an outgoing and friendly nature. Her parents owned a cabin outside the city, which quickly became her favorite place. Lynn eagerly counted down the days to spend her school vacations there. For her father, these visits were perfect for a getaway, while Lorraine loved the peaceful and beautiful surroundings filled with lakes and tranquility. As a fervent nature lover, it was there that Lynn developed a special affection for animals. It wasn't long before this fondness turned into a passion for rescuing and caring for abandoned animals with a particular soft spot for cats, making it common for her to always have a new pet. During her high school years, Lynn's keen interest in maintaining her appearance became evident to everyone. After graduating in 1974, she chose not to pursue a conventional university education, but instead decided to become a hairdresser. Encouraged by her father, Lynn opened her own salon, and in a short time, thanks to her people skills, she built a good clientele. During this period, she formed a close friendship with Corrine Poza. Also from Madison, Corrine was married. The two soon discovered they shared an appreciation for the simple things in life. Corrine admired Lynn's ability to think carefully about her decisions and manage her finances prudently, leading to a life without unnecessary luxuries. In 1983, Lynn started a romantic relationship with Jim Kelleher. Although few details of his biography are known, it is clear that his friends saw him as a man with a free and adventurous spirit. These qualities quickly won Lynn over. With this in mind, the couple embarked on a lifestyle that involved constantly moving, always in search of natural settings that offered the tranquility they yearned for. However, after a few years together, their relationship deteriorated, leading them to separate. Despite this, their affection for each other kept them close friends. During this time, Lynn met Jennifer Flower, a native of Franklin, Wisconsin, who was a single mother to a nine-year-old girl named Jessie Kurchevsky. Lynn's kind-hearted nature led her to support both mother and daughter, taking a special interest in helping raise young Jessie, to whom she grew very fond. In 1998, Corrine gave birth to her only son, Anthony Pozzo. From then on, he became a cherished member of Lynn's extended family. As he grew, Anthony enjoyed spending time with the Hernans, whether it was playing with Robert, who often shared stories about World War II, or watching classic movies with Lynn. In the summer of 2002, when Jesse graduated from high school, Lynn was bursting with pride. She would often show photos of the two of them at the graduation ceremony to visiting friends. Five years later, when Robert passed away, the loss was so profound for Lynn that she struggled with depression. However, thanks to her unyielding spirit and optimism, she eventually overcame this tough period. Meanwhile, her beloved Jessie was having a hard time adjusting to adulthood. Deciding not to pursue a college education, she frequently changed jobs, but these were not the only troubling signs. In February 2010, seeking quick money, Jesse opened a bank account under the names of a neighbor couple and took out loans totaling $4,000. Two months later, she committed even more serious acts of fraud, this time targeting her own mother. Without Jennifer's knowledge, Jessie took her social security card, IDs, checks, and car title, and secured a loan of over $6,000. She also obtained a car title loan. When an arrest warrant was issued for Jessie, she attempted to flee and used fraudulent checks to pay for a hotel. However, the authorities caught up with her and she was arrested. Eventually, Jesse was sentenced to two years in prison before becoming eligible for parole. In 2013, the death of Lorraine was another significant blow for Lynn, 
During this painful time, the unwavering support of her friend Corrine, along with visits from Jennifer and Jesse, who was now back on the outside after serving her sentence, were crucial in helping her heal. Lynn continued to live as she always had, focusing on saving money and enjoying the company of her beloved cats. Additionally, Lynn avoided using technology and did not own a cell phone or computer. She preferred handling her transactions with cash or checks, a method Anthony found outdated but also charming. Although she had a credit card, she used it sparingly and always tried to pay off any debt quickly. Meanwhile, Jesse had found a new job and started dating a man named Scott, who was single but had a daughter from a previous relationship. They soon decided to move in together and discovered a shared passion for casinos, visiting them twice a week. Jesse often spent all her money at these establishments. In early 2016, Lynn began experiencing various health problems, including back issues and heart and liver complications, which required constant medical attention. As a result, she spent most of her time at home. Initially, Jennifer took on the role of her caregiver, but eventually, it was her younger and more energetic daughter, Jessie, who assumed the responsibility. This gave Jessie access to Lynn's credit cards. Additionally, Lynn signed blank checks for her to assist with groceries and medications. In August 2016, when Anthony started university, he made it a habit to stop by Lynn's house on his way to campus. During their shared lunches, Lynn expressed her desire to support him financially with his studies. However, Anthony was adamant about not wanting their relationship to be seen as a ploy for financial gain. Despite this, Lynn always found a way to give him some money for his expenses. In contrast, during her frequent visits, Jessie began excessively using Lynn's credit cards, taking cash advances, making online purchases, and spending more than Lynn could afford. She squandered money in casinos and city bars, knowing Lynn did not closely monitor her finances. As Jessie's spending increased, her job performance declined and she was eventually fired. However, she kept this a secret, so neither her boyfriend nor her friends knew about it. She even lied to Scott, claiming that Lynn was in intensive care due to a coma, giving herself more time to do as she pleased without being at home. Aware of her declining health and the possibility of needing to move to a nursing home, Lynn was worried about the well-being of her cats. She entrusted Jessie with their care and gave her power of attorney to manage her belongings if necessary. She also drafted her will, naming Jessie and Anthony as the main beneficiaries. She informed both of them, albeit separately, about this decision. From that moment on, Jessie focused on finding the best way to permanently remove her benefactor from the picture. The devious plan didn't take long to form in Jessie's mind. As she was responsible for administering Lynn's medications, she discovered that among them were eye drops containing tetrahydrazoline. After researching online, she learned that ingesting large amounts of this substance could be fatal. One night, after returning home visibly drunk from a bar outing with friends, Jessie told her boyfriend, Scott, that someone might have spiked her drink with eye drops, causing her drowsiness. It was late, and Scott, also tired, dismissed her strange claim. In the last week of September 2018, Lynn was hospitalized and the medical staff recommended transferring her to a long-term rehabilitation unit. Lynn adamantly refused the suggestion, feeling ashamed of her physical condition. She forbade Jessie from mentioning her hospitalization to anyone, determined to avoid being seen in such a deplorable state, so unlike the woman she once was. That same week, remembering he had missed her birthday, Jim tried to reach out to her. However, Jessie answered Lynn's home phone and told him that Lynn was hospitalized and didn't want visitors. After being discharged from the hospital with a recommendation for home medical care, a first visit was scheduled for October 1st, 2018. 
However, Lin postponed it to October 5th, choosing to remain isolated from everyone. By this time, Jesse had already spent around $144,000 from Lin's accounts, but she wanted it all. On October 3rd, 2018, taking advantage of Lin's negligence towards her health, Jesse visited her under the pretext of administering her medications. While preparing the usual pills, she secretly poured the contents of six bottles of eye drops into a glass of water and offered it to Lin. The poison took effect, and Lin gradually lost consciousness and died. Jesse meticulously staged the scene, spreading some crushed pills on a table near Lin's body to give the impression of an overdose. She then called 911, reporting that she had found her friend unconscious and not breathing. When the responders arrived, they found Lynn lifeless in a reclining chair in the living room. In her statement to Officer Kelsey, Jesse explained her relationship with Lynn and her role as her caregiver, suggesting that Lynn, possibly overwhelmed by her health issues, had decided to take her own life. After transporting the body to the morgue, the police drafted a preliminary report, considering the case as a possible suicide. However, during interviews with her close circle, Jim expressed shock at such a possibility. He stated that the woman he had known for many years would never make such a decision, as it simply wasn't in her nature. Anthony shared a similar view telling investigators that despite Lynn's fragile health, he had always seen in her a strong optimism. When Anthony and Jesse met for the first time since the tragedy, Anthony couldn't help but notice the stark contrast between his own grief and Jesse's cold detachment and interest in the inheritance she was about to receive. Around this time, Jesse opened an account at a department store in Lynn's name to obtain a credit card. Shortly after, barely a week after Lynn's death, she announced a garage sale on her social media, selling Lynn's personal belongings, including her furniture. By the end of 2018, when Jesse appeared with expensive Christmas gifts, Scott became seriously alarmed. Just weeks later, the county medical examiner's office, which conducted toxicology tests on Lynn's body, found high levels of tetrahydrozoline in her blood, exacerbated by her other medications. The experts concluded that her death was not the result of self-harm or an accident, as it was impossible to ingest such a dose through normal eye use. The head of the medical examiner's office submitted the toxicology report to the authorities, prompting the sheriff's office to reopen the investigation. Once Jesse learned that the investigation had been reopened, she was keen to know the results, but the police refused to disclose them to her. In the following months, the investigation increasingly pointed to Jesse as the main suspect. On July 9, 2019, Jesse was arrested and interviewed by the police. During the interview, she tried to convince the authorities of her frustration over not knowing the cause of Lynn's death. The most striking detail was her claim that Lynn was a habitual user of both legal and illegal substances, although she was careful to note that this never prevented Lynn from being functional. Jesse alleged that while she always made sure Lynn adhered to her treatments, Lynn would abuse alcohol or pills, and during those times, thoughts of self-harm would emerge. In a subsequent interview, when questioned about her financial incentive for caring for Lynn all that time, Jesse explained that although there was never an official agreement, Lynn often gave her checks or allowed her to use her credit card. She emphasized to the agents that Lynn was always generous with her resources, a quality that stood out even more as she was aware of her impending end. During the third interview, the detectives played their strongest card, informing Jesse about the lethal tetrahydrazoline poisoning. Jesse immediately claimed that Lynn often used eye drops in large quantities, buying multiple bottles at once. The agents responded by pointing out that no such bottles were found at Lynn's residence, 
and that the substance levels in her system were inconsistent with ocular use. Faced with the evidence, Jessie's explanations became increasingly contradictory. Although she initially found the idea of voluntary ingestion hard to believe, she then suggested that Lynn might have researched ways to end her life and settled on poisoning. Regarding the crushed pills found on Lynn's body, Jessie said that Lynn had difficulty swallowing. However, the detectives, suspecting it was a staged scene, made their thoughts clear to Jessie. In response, Jessie vehemently denied any involvement in Lynn's death, even suggesting that the toxicologist had made an error, claiming she had never heard of the lethal effect of simple eye drops. The authorities then decided to question Scott. When they mentioned that Lynn had been administered high doses of the eye drop component, Scott recalled Jessie's strange comment about someone possibly spiking her drink with eye drops, causing her drowsiness. This led to another interrogation where Jessie again denied knowing about the substance's action. However, this time she changed her initial story, alleging that Lynn had confessed to her about unsuccessfully trying to take her own life with pills. According to Jessie, Lynn began mixing the eye drops with vodka over several days, though it only caused her stomach discomfort. Jessie also claimed to have seen Lynn drinking this mixture the day before her death. She then recounted that on the morning of October 3, 2018, Lynn asked for a bottle of water that she had previously filled with the contents of six eye drop bottles and vodka. They argued because Jessie refused to give it to her, but eventually, thinking it wouldn't be lethal given Lynn's habitual consumption of the mixture, she relented. When confronted by investigators about why she hadn't mentioned this before and why she didn't alert anyone to prevent the fatal outcome, Jessie simply stated that if Lynn didn't want to live anymore, she had every right to act accordingly. Despite her efforts to evade responsibility and avoid charges, the review of the credit card statements revealed unusual spending patterns for someone like Lynn, who rarely left the house. There were transactions in bars and casinos, places Lynn never frequented. At this stage, Anthony's cooperation with the authorities proved invaluable as he highlighted Lynn's financial habits, which starkly contrasted with these expenditures. Jessie's criminal history of fraud and her gambling addiction further exposed her malicious intent to the police, making her motives to harm Lynn crystal clear. Consequently, she was formally charged with first-degree intentional homicide and two counts of grand theft, though she pleaded not guilty. She was held without bail, with a bond set at $1 million. While in jail awaiting trial, Jessie formed a friendship with another inmate named Magdalena. Jessie confided in Magdalena that Lynn had died from an overdose of medications and even revealed that she had spent Lynn's money in casinos and on luxuries she otherwise couldn't afford. The process to bring Jessie to justice faced some delays, but finally commenced on October 24, 2023, after a five-year wait. In his opening statement, the prosecutor painted an unflattering picture of the accused for the jury. In response, the defense, referring to Lynn as a mother figure to their client, countered by claiming that Lynn herself would have disagreed with the prosecution's narrative if she were present, dismissing it as an unfounded story. The attorney described Lynn as a woman with self-destructive tendencies, insisting on the theory of a consummated self-harm. However, the testimony of the medical examiner starkly contrasted with this narrative, asserting that the poisoning was undoubtedly caused by a third party. He emphasized Jesse's suspicious insistence on knowing the cause of Lynn's death. The prosecution revisited this point, suggesting that during her crime planning, Jesse hadn't anticipated a toxicology test for tetrahydrazoline on her victim. When Jim and Anthony took the stand, they both agreed that Lynn would never have allowed Jessie to squander her assets. Then, 
an unexpected testimony emerged, further cornering the accused and solidifying the case against her. The significant revelations came from Magdalena, Jesse's cellmate. After two days of deliberations, on Tuesday, November 14th, 2023, the jury delivered its verdict. As the judge read the jury's decision, Jesse broke down in tears, aware that she faced the possibility of a mandatory life sentence. Outside the courthouse, the prosecutor expressed his condolences to Lynn's family, satisfied with the verdict. Anthony expressed immense gratitude to the detectives and prosecutors for their relentless pursuit of the truth. In his own words, thanks to them, he could confirm what he had always suspected, that something was not right with Jesse. The sentencing hearing took place on Friday, April 5, 2024. Accompanied by her new attorney, Jesse spoke for two hours about what she considered a flawed legal process, claiming she had not received effective defense. Nevertheless, after her testimony, the judge sentenced Jesse to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years for the crime against Lynn Hernan. Additionally, she must serve five consecutive years for the two counts of theft, making her ineligible for parole until she is 80 years old. Furthermore, she was ordered to pay $386,000 in restitution through an escrow account for any money earned from interviews, book deals, movies, or documentaries related to the case. Present in the courtroom during the victim impact statements, Anthony had a few words for Jesse, wishing that her time behind bars would allow her to reflect on her actions. He said that, as he had hoped, her facade had finally ended, and she could no longer deceive anyone. Although satisfied with the sentence, he expressed that it was impossible not to miss Lynn, who had been like an aunt to him. In honor of that love, Anthony plans to choose a monument where Lynn's remains can be laid to rest, seeking to provide her soul with the same tranquility and peace she always sought in life. I stripped his clothes. I cut open his belly to see his guts. They really pain me. Sorry, that was morbid. Um, and uh, then I cut off his head. I gave him a Glasgow smile, but a Joker smile. However, by piecing together information revealed during his 2023 trial, we can sketch a rough profile. Brian was born in 2002 and exhibited an early interest in death-related topics. He had a history of animal abuse and derived pleasure from watching particularly gory content. The timeless question in such cases is this. Did exposure to morbid material shape his personality, or was he inherently inclined toward darkness, with violent videos and games simply amplifying his existing tendencies? As Brian reached secondary school, certain disorders became apparent. He experienced severe mood swings and often preferred isolation when his peers were socializing. He rarely attended parties and had a notably cynical attitude. At 15, a family doctor diagnosed him with depression after a series of consultations. A few years later, he complained of severe headaches, prompting a CT scan to rule out clots, tumors, or other abnormalities. The results were normal, but the migraines persisted, causing him ongoing distress. Despite his evident frustration with these medical treatments, Brian remained cooperative, often ending each consultation with a resigned, half-hearted smile. Psychotic disorders were ruled out, but other concerning behaviors emerged. A counselor, 
contacted by Brian's mother to help him cope with the death of an uncle, observed that Brian showed little empathy for the loss. He admitted he was tired of pretending to feel sad about things that didn't affect him. Over time, Brian's counselor noted his constant questioning of why hurting or stealing was wrong, indicating a disturbing lack of moral understanding. He displayed no empathy for minorities, regarding transgender individuals as less than human. It became evident that Brian harbored a significant, concealed hatred. On multiple occasions, he was known to exploit the vulnerabilities of his peers to mock them. All these observations paint a troubling picture of Brian's mental and emotional state, despite his mother's persistent efforts to seek help for him. Before turning 18, Brian visited the Vocational Rehabilitation Division. The reason was that he claimed he couldn't comprehend how his decisions impacted his future or the lives of those around him. During this time, a third doctor met with him and asked about his future goals. Brian quickly listed his key influences. Adolf Hitler, Columbine shooters Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, serial killer Ted Bundy, and former Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin. The doctor, unfazed, took notes and quickly diagnosed Brian with a low level of autism. She requested further tests to explore his darker thoughts. However, Brian soon found a job and many of these tests were never conducted. Could these tests have predicted what Brian was about to do? That's a question that remains unanswered. Brian spent several months working various roles at a supermarket chain. One afternoon, he confided in a co-worker that he believed he had no friends and never would. The co-worker smiled and reassured him that everyone there was his friend. They're only my friends out of pity, Brian replied before getting up and continuing with his tasks. In a way, his comment held some truth. Everyone around Brian felt a mix of concern and pity for him. Despite his outburst of anger, he seemed to be in emotional pain and frequently sighed. Many saw him as a ticking time bomb, though no one expected what he would eventually do. From what has been revealed, Brian's mother was particularly worried about his well-being. She constantly sought out professionals who could help him and showed concern whenever someone spoke about him. However, after the incident, Many agreed that it was in the privacy of his home where Brian's cries for help were no longer heard. Brian's parents admitted that at some point, talking about crimes became an uncontrollable obsession for him. Whether during dinners, family gatherings, or outings, Brian always found an excuse to bring up the topic. He would directly and unambiguously declare that he was planning to kill someone. But Brian's parents, either out of negligence or an inability to accept the truth, convinced themselves he was joking. They even tried to reassure each other, suggesting that Brian's obsession might be the precursor to a career as a forensic investigator or police officer. In their more optimistic moments, they envisioned their son solving crimes or conducting autopsies that would uncover mysteries. However, their optimism would falter when Brian sat in front of them, grinning from ear to ear, and casually discussed ways to dispose of a body. Though his words frightened them, Brian would quickly dismiss their fears by claiming he was merely showcasing his dark sense of humor. He would then head off to work, leaving his parents with a lingering chill. That chill grew more intense as other troubling signs emerged. In the last days of February 2021, Brian's mother felt a spontaneous sense of relief. For over a week, Brian hardly mentioned anything about murders or dismemberments. He seemed more talkative about everyday matters, asking about their work and showing interest in household affairs. He even appeared enthusiastic about his future. His mother recalled the doctor's words, suggesting that Brian's fascination with death might be a phase that would suddenly vanish. But Brian's father was not so convinced. He suspected this newfound calm might be the proverbial quiet before the storm. 
in hindsight, he wasn't wrong. The storm was just beginning. On the last day of February, Brian's father got into the car that Brian often borrowed and found a wallet under the seat. It was clear at first glance that the wallet didn't belong to any family member. His initial thought was that it might belong to one of Brian's friends or a girl he had dated, but he knew deep down that Brian didn't socialize much and didn't have an active romantic life. With trembling fingers, he opened the wallet and found a driver's license belonging to a man named Warren Barnes, nearly 70 years old. Why was it there? With his heart pounding and fear gripping him, he nervously confronted Brian, unsure of what chilling revelation might come next. Brian calmly explained that he had found the documents on the street. Noticing his father's paranoia, Brian even joked that if he had killed Warren, he wouldn't be so foolish as to leave incriminating evidence in the car. Oddly enough, this logic seemed to make sense to his father, who reluctantly accepted the explanation. But the uneasy peace lasted only a few hours. Later, Brian's mother found a red stain on the car upholstery. Once again, Brian laughed it off, claiming it was paint from a special effects course he had enrolled in. Desperate to believe him, his parents clung to his explanation, their minds racing with doubt and fear. Were they losing their grip on reality? Were they so afraid of their son becoming a monster that they saw signs where there were none? Did that make them worse monsters than their son? They felt guilty for suspecting the boy they had raised, who clearly needed help and seemed incapable of harming anyone. Their doubts made them feel ashamed. Despite this, Brian's mother couldn't shake her instinct that something was wrong. The next day, she took advantage of his absence to enter his room, later claiming she was just trying to tidy up. Whether that was true or she was searching for secrets waiting to be uncovered, she started looking around. After checking under the bed and in drawers, she opened Brian's closet and found a plastic container with bags inside. The bags emitted a nauseating odor that filled the room, making her stomach churn. As she cautiously approached, she noticed maggots crawling out of the seams, their writhing bodies a horrifying testament to the sinister contents within. Horrified and acting on instinct, she took the bags to the kitchen sink. Fighting back nausea, she opened them with a cloth. What she saw made her nearly faint. Barely able to stand, she made three calls. The first was to her husband, asking him to come home immediately. The second was to Brian, telling him to come home no matter what he was doing. They needed to talk. The third call took the most time. She dialed 911 and, through sobs, told the operator she had found a head in her 19-year-old son's closet. The operator assured her help was on the way and urged her to stay calm. Now on one is John with the address emergency. Hi, there is an emergency. I found, found something in my son's closet wrapped in a plastic bag. Okay, what was it? I think it's a human head. It's a what? I think it's a human head. Why do you think it's that? Because it looks like it. It's all an ear. Is it all, is it bloody or does it like anything like that? I just told you to come. Do I have to take a picture and send it to you? What's you the just address? Come? Is your son there now? He just pulled up. We wanted to make sure he was here before we called. How old is he? 19. He's had a little bit of a fascination with the morbid, but he was channeling it, I thought, into becoming a crime scene investigator, but not so much. When the police arrived, the sequence of events that unfolded was recorded and remains chilling to those who watch it. It's just a few seconds, but enough to make many lose faith in humanity. Brian spoke about what he did with a chilling lack of emotion. Okay, so parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Um, yeah, I believe so. And what would it be? A human head and hands. That same day, he was arrested. Well, like I said, I'll get that air on for you. I'm sorry about that. All right. He was brought to the police station for questions. Oh, I should have a mask. You're okay. Don't worry about it, okay? Keep on walking. Keep going. 
Bay's mother was also subjected to interrogation. <laughs> After some time, he began to reveal some horrific truths. I stripped his clothes. I cut open his belly to see his guts. They're really pink. Sorry, that was morbid. Um, and uh, then I cut off his head. I gave him a Glasgow smile, but a Joker smile. His trial took place nearly two years later, in January 2023. On the stand, he repeated what he had told those taking his testimony over the months. Even during his initial confession, he appeared almost happy as he recounted his crime. Brian had decided to bring his homicidal fantasies into reality and devised a plan. From reading about serial killers online, he learned the importance of choosing his victim carefully. To avoid getting caught, he needed to target someone who wouldn't be missed, reducing the risk of immediate suspicion. This led him to conclude that his best option was to kill a prostitute or a homeless person. He began patrolling his neighborhood at night, armed with a kitchen knife, driving slowly and watching intently. He studied locations, times, observed routines, and took notes. Gradually, he identified more isolated areas in the least patrolled blocks. His obsession grew, and by February 27, 2021, he had become a predator on the hunt. That night, Brian found his target, a homeless man sleeping under a bridge near Crossview Avenue. Without hesitation, Brian acted on his sinister plan. He activated the vehicle's hazard lights and stepped out with a determined stride. There was no hesitation or moment of reflection. Brian approached the man sleeping on the ground and attacked decisively, killing him with a knife. According to his account, the victim didn't even wake up. The cuts were so precise that he bled out almost immediately. Once the body stopped convulsing, Brian stood there for a few minutes, watching. As the adrenaline began to subside, doubt crept in. Had he left fibers from his clothes on the body? What if, in the frenzy of the attack, he had left fingerprints? He couldn't allow that to happen. It went against everything he had learned. Ensuring no one was watching, Brian proceeded with what seemed the most logical action in his fevered state. He decapitated the victim and severed his hands, placing these parts into bags. He then put the rest of the body into his car trunk after removing the wallet and other documents from the man's pockets. Brian attempted to sink the car in the Colorado River before returning home. It was early morning by then. He locked himself in his room, his heart still racing. The next day, his parents reported the car missing and Brian acted as if nothing had happened. He even started showing more affection and connection with those around him, as previously mentioned. In the following days, Brian spent hours drawing maps, selecting locations to dispose of the incriminating bags. But he never got the chance. His mother discovered them first. Ultimately, things didn't go as Brian had planned. Moreover, Brian had chosen his victim poorly. Despite his assumption that the man's disappearance would go unnoticed, the reality was quite the opposite. Warren Barnes, 69, was a well-known figure in that part of town, and everyone had a great deal of affection for him. His disappearance was reported on February 28th by the owner of a bookstore on Crossview Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets. Warren was known for borrowing books every morning with meticulous regularity. When he missed his routine, people became worried. When was the last time you saw him? Saturday, 5 o'clock. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, Warren, and he was like, okay, meaning he planned on coming down on Sunday, and then he did not show up. The Colorado Sun revealed that Warren was known in Grand Junction as the Reading Man. He was a cheerful character who always chatted with neighbors about literature recommended authors and engaged in debates. When he saw others feeling down, 
He would tell them stories to lift their spirits, always parting with a smile and a wish for a good day. Nearby cafe members frequently gave him food and hot drinks, and other shopkeepers left chairs outside their stores for him to sit and read for hours. Occasionally, he did odd jobs around the neighborhood, earning a few bills to keep himself warm when the weather turned harsh. Brian's assumption that Warren's absence would go unnoticed was gravely mistaken. Warren also loved birds and prided himself on recognizing their unique songs. His family had often tried to persuade him to leave his transient lifestyle, but Warren always appreciated their concern while insisting he was content. He enjoyed living simply, respected by everyone around him. Warren believed that despite everything, things could turn out well. He sought nothing more than to have pleasant conversations each day before losing himself in his books and stories. Warren possessed an unusual innocence for his 69 years, devoid of malice and corrosive ambition. Everyone loved Warren. That's why his absence was immediately noticed, and the police were called when he didn't show up as usual. His sister Geraldine recounted how Warren had called her just hours before his death to wish her a happy birthday. He had done so in his cheerful tone, wishing her all her dreams come true. She was the last person he spoke to before lying down under the bridge, never to wake again. During the trial, a group of neighbors requested to testify about who Warren was. They emphasized that not having a home didn't make a person any less valuable or disposable. Two Colorado State psychologists who evaluated Brian for his insanity plea concluded he wasn't insane at the time of the murder. Another psychologist, assessing Brian separately for the defense, argued he had experienced a psychotic episode triggered by the attack on Warren, which subsided shortly afterward. Brian's mother took the stand, expressing her condolences to Warren's family through tears. She asked that Brian's sentence include mental health treatment, insisting her son was more than the sum of his mental defects and actions. She hoped Brian still had a chance to contribute positively to society. Brian doesn't think or feel like the rest of us, she said before leaving the courtroom, her voice trembling. A palpable tension filled the room as everyone's eyes turned to the judge. It was time for the verdict. The judge in charge, with 37 years in the judicial system, including 16 as a judge, remarked that this was one of the most horrific cases he had ever encountered. Since Brian had confessed to the crime in detail, his lawyers based their defense on his mental health. They argued that Brian's declaration of wanting to become a famous killer was a sign of his insanity. They also cited his major depressive disorder combined with environmental stressors as factors leading to temporary insanity. However, the prosecution argued the opposite. They claimed Brian had meticulously planned the murder for months and that the dismemberment of the body to hide evidence demonstrated cold, calculated, and meticulous behavior. On February 6, 2023, 20 days after the trial began, the judge delivered a clear decision, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Today, Brian is incarcerated at the Buena Vista Correctional Complex in Colorado. Mesa County Assistant District Attorney Trish Marr conveyed her sorrow over the brutal murder of Warren Barnes. She remarked, Warren Barnes was taken from us in an incredibly violent manner. His friends, family, and the community deeply feel his absence. This case underscores the checks and balances of our criminal justice system. Justice was served when the jury delivered guilty verdicts, holding the defendant accountable for his atrocious crimes. Meanwhile, in November 2021, a monument was erected in Warren's memory near the main street of Grand Junction. Created by artist Tim Navin, the installation features a chair under the shade of a tree with a stack of books on the seat. Poetically, 
it serves as a fitting sanctuary. However, the absence of the reading man is still deeply felt in the daily life of the town, which remains shrouded in a bit more sadness following Brian's actions. On November 27th, 2021, the police in Hamilton, Scotland received a report about the disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Amber Gibson. Amber was living at the Hill House Children's Unit and had left the day before, on November 26th, to meet her 19-year-old brother, Connor Gibson. However, Amber never returned and her disappearance triggered the investigation into one of the most shocking cases in Scotland's history. Born on November 1, 2005 in Scotland, Amber Gibson was the second child of Anne Marie Adams and Peter Gibson. She joined the family two years after the birth of their first child, Connor Gibson. Amber, a beautiful red-haired baby, contrasted sharply with her brother, who had fair skin and dark hair. Their striking looks and cheerful personalities made them stand out. However, their home was marred by domestic violence. From a tender age, Amber and Connor witnessed their father's abusive behavior towards their mother. Peter's violence knew no bounds, causing physical, emotional, and mental harm to Anne Marie. He also had a criminal history which included assaults on two minors and the abuse of an unknown woman. Due to these dire circumstances, both Amber and Connor were removed from their parental home and placed in the care of social services. After a thorough evaluation, they were relocated to live with the Niven family. Craig and Carol Niven, along with their two daughters, provided a nurturing and harmonious environment this new home offered Amber and Connor a chance for a loving and dignified life, far removed from their troubled beginnings. At the ages of three and five, respectively, Amber and Connor found solace and security with the Nivens. Connor even reassured Amber, saying they were finally safe. Meanwhile, their biological father, Peter, was convicted and sentenced to prison for his crimes. Craig and Carol Niven committed themselves to being exemplary parents. Their dedication led to the permanent custody of both children. Despite this positive change, Connor's past trauma began to manifest as he entered adolescence. Hoping it was just a phase, Craig and Carol took steps to address his needs, including enrolling him in a secondary school for children with social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Amber, in contrast, was flourishing. She displayed remarkable human qualities despite her early hardships. Generous, caring, and kind-hearted, Amber had an incredible perspective on life. She loved art and singing and attended Morehouse Academy Bathgate. Her teachers and classmates admired her brilliance and vivacity, noting her big dreams and aspirations for the future. Amber's adoptive parents couldn't have been more pleased, and her foster sisters, Zero, were equally happy to have her around. However, Connor's behavior became increasingly concerning. Former classmates described him as unpleasant and noted that he spoke about harming others. There were even rumors that he had threatened a baby during that period. At home, things were no better. Craig eventually decided that leaving Connor alone with his younger sister was not advisable. He mentioned that they were not a good combination together, but never elaborated further. Despite the conflicts, Amber remained loyal to her brother, always trying to keep the peace. Then, an unexplained event occurred. Although Amber seemed like an ideal foster child, at 14, the care arrangement was terminated and she moved to the Hill House Children's Unit in Hamilton. Paradoxically, her problematic brother stayed with the Nivens for another two years until he turned 18. Shortly after, Connor moved to the Blue Triangle Homeless Shelter. Despite the distance, Amber ensured that Connor remained a constant presence in her life. 
When Amber was 16, she crossed paths with Jamie Starrs, a 20-year-old leading a chaotic lifestyle, living just three miles from her new residence. Jamie had been removed from his parents' care at three years old and had led a troubled life, including substance abuse and criminal behavior. In May 2021, Jamie assaulted a young woman in the area. Taking advantage of her intoxicated state, he proceeded without her consent. When the victim reported the assault to the authorities, Jamie sent threatening messages to her friend via social media, attempting to coerce her into withdrawing the complaint. Despite the friend's testimony, his identity was legally protected. Jamie was charged with the assault and attempting to pervert the course of justice, resulting in his arrest. However, he was soon released on bail. In June 2021, Amber traveled to Bothwell, the place where Jamie lived. Although she didn't know Jamie, they ended up in the same lodging unit. That night, while Amber was asleep, Jamie attacked and assaulted her. Amber awoke to find herself undressed, with Jamie, also naked, beside her. She had no recollection of embracing or kissing him, leading to speculation that he might have drugged her, though no tests were conducted to confirm this. Gathering her courage, Amber reported the assault to the police. She identified Jamie from a photo lineup. The police started investigating the case. In July, Jamie faced justice again. Witnesses included the Amber and the first victim. Their testimonies revealed Jamie's method of preying on vulnerable girls. Jamie appeared in court via video link from police custody. His defense argued that his actions might be linked to his traumatic childhood. However, acknowledging his difficult past, the high court judged him for his poor choices. Jamie was found guilty of both assaults. His name added indefinitely to the sex offender registry. He was also convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice and breaching bail conditions. The sentencing hearing at the High Court in Edinburgh soon followed. One of the first to speak was the defense attorney, who emphasized that the authorities should consider the sentencing guidelines for individuals under 25 years old. In Scotland, the law suggests that younger people should receive lighter sentences due to their emotional immaturity and higher potential for rehabilitation. To support his argument, the defense lawyer pointed out a report indicating that Jamie exhibited cognitive and emotional immaturity. After hearing the defense's case, the judge acknowledged the relevance of Jamie's age and difficult background. However, he reminded Jamie and everyone in attendance that the crimes were still severe, even describing them as atrocious due to their impact on innocent victims. Consequently, the judge sentenced Jamie to ten and a half years in prison. Moreover, given the high risk of reoffending, Jamie was ordered to be under supervision for two years following his release. After the hearing, the police stated that the evidence and testimony provided by Amber were crucial in securing the conviction. Throughout this challenging process, Connor reached out to the Hill House Children's Unit to talk to his sister. Despite knowing his volatile temperament, Amber clung to the hope of reconnecting with her only available family member. The residence manager tried to discourage her from contacting Connor, but her efforts were in vain. Amber's close friend recalled that, despite their turbulent relationship, Amber had a special bond with Connor and was eager to see him. However, just as suddenly as he appeared, he disappeared, leaving her with unanswered questions. Amber tried to move forward with her life as best as she could, demonstrating an enviable spirit and determination. After a few months, Connor resurfaced, Likely driven by genuine affection for her only biological family member, Amber was excited when he expressed his desire to meet. They arranged a time and date and met in downtown Hamilton on the night of Friday, November 26, 2021. Overjoyed by her brother's presence, Amber took a selfie with him and posted it on her social media profile. 
it was the last time anyone heard from her. Around 10 p.m., security cameras captured the siblings walking together through the streets of Hamilton. At some point, out of the camera's view, Connor attacked Amber. He assaulted her, inflicted severe head and body injuries, and then strangled her until she died. About 90 minutes later, without attempting to hide the body, Connor headed back to the hostel where he was staying. Security cameras recorded his disheveled state and footage showed him collapsing against a metal barrier. He eventually pulled himself together and disposed of his blood-stained clothes. Just before midnight, he returned to the hostel and told a staff member that he and his sister had argued. Later, another camera showed Connor going to the dumpsters outside the building with a plastic bucket in hand. He also called the Hill House Children's Unit, telling them not to worry if Amber didn't return, insisting that she was fine. Despite his assurances, the authorities reported Amber missing that same night. On Friday, November 26, 2021, Retired William Corrigan took his 45-year-old son, Stephen Corrigan, to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Due to a recent fall, Stephen had his arm in a sling and needed extra support from his father. After getting vaccinated, Stephen decided to take a night walk and stumbled upon Amber's abandoned body. Rather than alerting the police, Stephen committed his own heinous acts by desecrating Amber's remains. He then concealed her body among leaves and bushes before leaving. Unaware of Amber's tragic fate, her loved ones and the authorities searched for her everywhere. Meanwhile, Connor sent a cryptic message to a group of five friends, saying he needed help with something without specifying details. To create an alibi, he messaged Amber, asking if she was okay. He then told his friends that he had resolved the issue on his own. As the search for Amber continued, Craig and Carol grew increasingly anxious. They hadn't heard from Connor until a call on Sunday, November 28, 2021, when he told them that he and Amber had fought the previous Friday. Later that same Sunday, the police finally discovered Amber's body. Her underwear had been torn and she had suffered severe head trauma. After securing the scene, investigators searched the area and found Amber's blood-stained shorts and t-shirt in a nearby dumpster. After informing her loved ones of the tragic outcome, the detective team began reconstructing Amber's movements from the last time she was seen to when her life was taken and her body left in the middle of nowhere. At a press conference, one of the detectives appealed to the public for information. He emphasized the importance of understanding the events leading to Amber's fatal attack and urged anyone with information to come forward to help bring closure to her family. Knowing the community's fear and parents' concerns for their daughter's safety, he stressed that capturing the perpetrator was crucial for public safety. He pointed out that Amber was last seen in a busy part of town on a Friday night, suggesting there must have been many witnesses. He called on anyone who saw her to contact the authorities. Following the press conference, some people came forward with potential information, but none provided useful leads. Investigators continued their work and the forensic pathologist's report highlighted that Amber was found covered in mud and had died from neck compression. Blood stains found on her jacket were sent for DNA analysis, which revealed a chilling truth. The blood matched her brother Connor's DNA. Additionally, Connor's DNA was found on Amber's forcibly removed underwear. Another unidentified male DNA sample was also discovered complicating the case further. With such evidence in hand, Connor became the prime suspect in the case. He continued to feign innocence and create false alibis that quickly fell apart. One such clumsy attempt was a social media post on December 1st, where he pretended to pay tribute to his sister, lavishing her with praise and claiming he would miss her dearly. The next day, 
He searched the internet on his phone for ways to mislead the police. He also posted several angry messages on his social media accounts. Hours later, he was arrested. Meanwhile, the details of the case were kept under strict confidentiality to avoid jeopardizing the investigation. However, some information leaked and it became known that the victim's brother was under police scrutiny. Feeling the pressure from the police, Connor did not give up trying to distance himself from the crime. Instead, he pushed a local media outlet to publish a tribute to his sister. Forensic DNA analyses and other evidence continued to provide valuable information at a rapid pace. It was determined that Connor's clothing had traces of his sister's blood. Additionally, the analysis revealed that the third biological material belonged to Stephen Corrigan. A cybercrime expert analyzed Connor's phone and uncovered further evidence that clarified the case. Suspicious messages to his group of five friends and the one sent to Amber, knowing he had just killed her, were particularly incriminating. His internet search history only further exposed him. As these details began to emerge publicly, the complex story of Amber's tragic end came to light. Connor had to appear in Hamilton Sheriff Court to face charges of murder, sexual assault, and attempting to pervert the course of justice. Prosecutors stated that Amber had complete trust in her brother, which he brutally betrayed by taking her life. The court ruled that Connor should remain in police custody pending further investigations and court appearances. Stephen Corrigan was also arrested shortly thereafter. On January 13, 2022, he appeared in Hamilton Sheriff Court, charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice. He pleaded not guilty. Like Connor, Stephen was held in police custody awaiting his trial. The year 2022 was filled with legal proceedings, making it an extremely challenging time for Carol and her husband, Craig, who were grappling with the grief of losing Amber and the shock of Connor's possible guilt. On November 1st, 2022, which would have been Amber's 17th birthday, her friends and family celebrated her memory. They shared heartfelt messages and wishes for her eternal rest, along with photos of her on social media. Carol changed her profile picture to one of Amber, finding a measure of peace in the gesture, feeling that it symbolized having done everything possible for her. Additionally, Amber's loved ones created a memorial under a bridge near where her body was found. They placed bouquets, balloons, and candles in her honor. Unfortunately, the memorial was vandalized a few days later when vandals set fire to a nearby dumpster, causing flames to spread. In response, family and friends held a gathering in a park, releasing balloons, some shaped like the letter A for Amber, into the sky. While the wound from Amber's loss remained fresh, Connor's trial finally took place in July 2023. Throughout the trial, Connor denied any involvement in the crime and the sexual assault against his sister. Despite his denials, the evidence against him was overwhelming. His defense lawyer attempted to garner some sympathy from the court by highlighting Connor's lifelong neglect and emotional abuse, suggesting these factors could explain some of his actions. Next, the director of health and social care testified, describing the case as desperately sad and distressing. The court also heard that Connor appeared unshaken when speaking with Craig on the day Amber's body was found. Craig testified about Connor's increasingly problematic behavior. After a 13-day trial, the Glasgow High Court found Connor guilty of all three charges. The judge described the crime as depraved and warned Connor that he would face severe consequences. Fifteen days later, Stephen faced justice for his involvement. During his trial, he tried to present an unassailable alibi, claiming he spent the night at his elderly father's home and had spent much of the time playing computer games. However, 
the evidence against him continued to mount. Stephen also claimed that he didn't know why his DNA was found on Amber's body. While William corroborated much of his son's account, he admitted to the jury that he couldn't be certain of Stephen's actions during most of that weekend. Ultimately, Stephen was found guilty of attempting to pervert the course of justice and disturbing public order. In September 2023, during a joint hearing, both men received their sentences. Connor Gibson was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 22 years before he can be considered for parole. Stephen received a nine-year prison sentence. In a statement following the trial, Craig and Carol acknowledged that their lives would never be the same. They described Amber as the most generous, caring, compassionate, and admirable person they had ever known. What was meant to be a joyful family camping trip full of laughter, s'mores, and starry nights turned into an unimaginable nightmare for the Schmidt family. In the early hours of July 22, 2022, an unknown assailant brutally murdered three family members while they slept in their tent. The tragedy sent shockwaves through the community, leaving everyone to question who could commit such a heinous crime. In this video, we'll explore the details of this harrowing case and attempt to understand the tragedy that claimed the lives of three innocent individuals. This is the chilling story of the Schmidt family. Tyler Schmidt was born on November 13, 1979, in Iowa, USA. He grew up in Cedar Falls, a city known for being home to the University of Northern Iowa. From a young age, Tyler joined the Boy Scouts, where he achieved the esteemed rank of Eagle Scout. This experience ignited his lifelong love for nature and camping. Tyler especially enjoyed the camps organized by the Lutheran Church, which encouraged family gatherings. While he learned to play the trumpet in his free time, his true passion lay in adventure and sports. He participated in cross-country running, and was a member of the swim team at Northern Iowa High School in Cedar Falls. Additionally, he enjoyed canoeing, hiking, and snowshoeing. His interest in computing led him to Missouri, where he studied computer science at Truman State University. There, he not only earned his degree, but also met Sarah, who would later become his wife. Sarah was born on March 27, 1980, in Kansas City. She spent part of her childhood near St. Louis with her siblings, Karen, Jane, and Adam. Sarah shared Tyler's love for outdoor activities, especially bird watching and studying insects. Like Tyler, she was a Girl Scout and received the highest recognition, the Gold Award. She inherited her adventurous spirit from her mother, with whom she went backpacking in Central America. It was no surprise that Tyler knew she was his soulmate upon meeting her. As a student, Sarah excelled not only academically, but also in leading student projects aimed at improving school life. Her positive leadership and inclination earned her the prestigious Truman Scholarship while still at Washington High School in Washington, Missouri. This scholarship led her to Truman State University, where she met Tyler. They fell in love, started dating, and she readily accepted his marriage proposal. Both Tyler's and Sarah's family supported their decision to marry, as it was evident that they were perfect for each other and destined to build a beautiful family together. On Saturday, June 22, 2002, Friends and family of Tyler and Sarah began arriving, elegantly dressed, at St. John Lutheran Church, located in Cedar Falls. The guests took their seats as directed by the wedding organizers. Seated at the front were Tyler's parents and Sarah's mother with her siblings. Nearby were Tyler's uncles and cousins. Outside the church, 
Sarah waited to make her entrance, accompanied by her father, who was ready to walk her down the aisle and give her away to her future husband. That day, Tyler and Sarah, both 22 years old, exchanged vows and promised to stay together until death parted them. Their shared love for nature led them to choose Boundary Waters, a well-known wilderness area on the border between the United States and Canada, specifically between Minnesota and Ontario, as the destination for their 10-day honeymoon. In the first decade of their marriage, Tyler and Sarah focused on achieving economic stability and furthering their professional careers. After earning their bachelor's degrees in Missouri, the couple moved to Lawrence to pursue their respective master's degrees at the University of Kansas, where Sarah eventually worked. As a computer science expert, Tyler worked for a supermarket, a delivery company, and UPS. He also spent 18 years at a company specializing in business-to-business -business billing and payments. Beyond their professional commitments, the early years of the Schmidt's marriage were filled with adventures. They always found ways to spend time together and explore new natural destinations. They frequently gathered with family or friends to enjoy their shared love of board games. Occasionally, they participated in activities organized by members of the Lutheran Church and, as avid fans of the Kansas Jayhawks, supported the basketball tournaments held at the Allen Fieldhouse. The year 2013 was bittersweet for the couple. On one hand, Sarah's father passed away from a heart attack, a significant loss for his loved ones. On the other hand, after 11 years of marriage, the couple welcomed their first child, Arlo. Three years later, on September 17, 2015, they experienced the joy of parenthood again with the birth of a beautiful daughter, Lula Schmidt. When Arlo was six and Lula was three, the family moved to Cedar Falls to be closer to Tyler's relatives. Cedar Falls welcomed them warmly and they soon became active members of the community. Tyler continued working as a software engineer while Sarah started working as an assistant at the city's public library and the children enrolled in Lincoln Elementary School's preschool. Tyler and Sarah were known for their kindness and willingness to help others, making everyone around them feel important. This commitment earned them the affection of their neighbors and the entire community. The same was true at the library where Sarah worked. Her warmth and friendly demeanor quickly made her well-known and appreciated both inside and outside the library. The couple made sure to instill in Arlo and Lula the same passion they had for outdoor activities and nature. In 2021, they began camping with their children, and despite their busy schedules, the children loved these outings so much that the parents made time for them whenever possible. By mid-2022, Sarah was working long hours. Nevertheless, in June, she took a day off to celebrate their 20th wedding anniversary and planned to take another day in July to go on a family vacation. She had to finish a project for the library before July 26th, but was determined not to let it interfere with the family's plans. During the week of July 11th, Sarah mentioned to Caddy, her brother Adam's wife, that she would be camping with the children at Makwakeda Cave State Park, a popular destination for hikers and explorers in Jackson County, Iowa, famous for its 13 impressive caves and stunning natural landscapes. On Thursday, July 21st, the family packed their car and drove roughly 140 miles to reach Makwakita Caves. Tyler and Sarah, both 42, along with their children Arlo, 9, and Lula, 7, arrived at the campsite before 5 p.m. The camping area was packed, so the Scheimitz set up near the park's entrance. A few hours later, around 7 p.m., another family parked about 200 feet from their tent. This was Joe and Cecilia Sherwin and their 23-year-old son, Anthony Sherwin, from Nebraska. The Sherwins set up two tents, one for the parents and another for their son. 
They were on their way home after a week and a half camping trip that took them to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The journey had been enjoyable and had strengthened the bond between Joe, Cecilia, and Anthony. Anthony was always attentive to his parents' needs, and his mother often said he was the best son she could have wished for, kind, sensitive, and an exceptional student. That year, Anthony was working on a computerized system to support a business he claimed was worth millions. He mentioned that part of the profits would be used to help his parents financially. Cecilia knew little about the project because Anthony kept the details of the mysterious business to himself, only mentioning that he sent emails under strict security. As night fell at Makwaketa Caves, the campers settled into their tents. Before dawn on July 22nd, the park's visitors were jolted awake by the sound of gunshots. Just before the commotion, a man dressed in black entered the Schmidt's tent and attacked Tyler and then Sarah. Arlo, who had been asleep, woke up to the sound of his sister Lula's screams. As he turned, he saw blood inside the tent. Terrified, he managed to escape and ran to seek help. As he fled, he heard one last shot. <laughs> Cecilia and Joe, in the neighboring campsite, rushed out of their tent amid the confusion. Joe searched for his son among the campers, asking if anyone had seen him. Arlo, still frantic, ran until he encountered the Sherwins. He was screaming and asking for help, saying his parents had been shot. Cecilia took his hand and ran with him to the park entrance. Once there, terrified and unsure of what had happened, she pulled out her phone and dialed 911. She was worried because her son was sleeping near the tent where the shots had come from and feared he might be among the victims. The Jackson County 911 operator understood when Cecilia reported hearing gunshots, but she struggled to pronounce the park's name, making it hard to convey the location. She also explained she was with a boy claiming his parents had been shot. The call between Cecilia and 911 lasted 23 minutes. While she answered questions, the operator relayed the attack to the police and park rangers. Although the call was briefly disconnected, Cecilia persisted and called back, only to be put on hold while the dispatcher contacted emergency responders. Despite the tension and nervousness in the park, adrenaline helped Cecilia stay calm. After providing details about their exact location, she handed the phone to Arlo. The boy explained to the dispatcher that he was in a tent with his mom, sister, and dad and when he woke up, he saw someone dressed in black holding a gun. The 911 operator asked the child where his father was, and after a pause, he responded that he thought his father was hurt. Around 6.30 a.m., police officers and paramedics arrived at the scene and headed to the Schmidt's tent. What they found was horrifying. All the occupants of the tent were dead. The beautiful campsite had turned into a crime scene. Law enforcement immediately began searching for the shooter, knowing he could be anywhere. The tactical team quickly evacuated Makokeda Caves, State Park, and Camp Shalom, a Christian summer camp located about 1.5 miles from the site of the attack. As officials evacuated the visitors, they gathered them outside the park. Once everyone was accounted for, it was confirmed that only one person was missing. Anthony Sherwin. He was not only missing, but also armed. At 11 a.m., police officers conducting an aerial search spotted a man's body. When they reached him, they found he was deceased. It was Anthony. Although investigations were necessary, the police identified him as the suspect in the homicides. They believed he had committed the deadly attack on the Schmitz and then taken his own life. The incident led authorities to close the park, a measure that remained in effect until July 28th. The Iowa Department of Natural Resources expressed its condolences for the incident. 
their spokesperson, issued a statement saying she and the entire team were devastated by the event, which had shaken the tradition of enjoying the state's natural wonders. But the legacy would continue for the millions of families who recreate in Iowa's parks. When citizens of Cedar Falls heard the news, they were shocked. The atmosphere changed suddenly, as if a gray veil had covered the sky. The reactions of family, friends, acquaintances, and even those who didn't know the victims were filled with pain. Cedar Falls was in mourning. In one of the windows of the Cedar Falls Public Library where Sarah worked, a sign was placed with a message saying that Tyler, Sarah, and Lula had left too soon but would always be in their hearts. The company where Tyler worked as a software engineer issued a statement describing him as a consummate professional and a mentor to his colleagues who were devastated when they heard about the tragedy. They knew of the love Tyler had for his children and his dedication to sharing his knowledge with little Arlo. The mayor of Cedar Falls also expressed his devastation over the loss of three beloved community members on his Facebook wall. He knew Sarah well as they had worked together on a tech project. The mayor also urged the residents of Cedar Falls to be generous towards Arlo, the sole survivor of the family, who was safe, and he shared a GoFundMe link for those wishing to donate. Within a few days, the initiative had raised over $276,000. In response to the tragedy, the local authority ordered the closure of the library for the rest of the day out of respect for Sarah's co-workers, the tragedy also elicited reactions from other political leaders. Iowa governor expressed her horror at the attack and sorrow for the unimaginable tragedy. And a U.S. House representative from Iowa tweeted that it was a senseless and horrific crime. Sarah's family was heartbroken. Her sister said she felt her life had been shattered, unable to believe that Sarah would no longer be just a phone call away and that she wouldn't see her niece grow up. Sarah's family traveled from North Dakota, Texas, and Michigan to join the rest of the family for the private funeral service held at Greenwood Cemetery. On August 2nd, a gathering was held to celebrate the lives of Tyler, Sarah, and Lula at the picnic area of Overman Park. More than 200 people attended. Several attendees, including Tyler's aunt and the mayor, spoke at the podium set up for the occasion, sharing their feelings and memories of the deceased. The mayor concluded the speeches by confessing that he had once envisioned Sarah with her heart dedicated to the community, representing Cedar Falls politically in the future. While the loved ones of the Schmitz dealt with their grief and tried to provide comfort and attention to Arlo, Authorities continued their investigation into the horrific crime. According to information released by the Iowa Department of Public Safety, based on autopsy findings, Tyler had a gunshot wound and multiple sharp force injuries. His wife Sarah had only sharp force injuries while their young daughter had been both shot and strangled. In early August 2022, Authorities released official information on the case, naming Anthony Sherwin as the person responsible for the Schmidt family's murder. According to the police, the 23-year-old who had no prior criminal record was the sole person involved in the incident before taking his own life. The investigation did not reveal any motive for the attack. The assistant director of the Division of Criminal Investigation stated that no connection was established between Anthony and the Schmidt family prior to that fateful day or during their time as neighboring campers. The police department in Nebraska assisted with the investigation. When officers searched the Sherwin family apartment in Nebraska, they found no suicide note or any indication that could explain why Anthony targeted the Schmidt family and himself. His Facebook page was also void of any clues, as it was completely blank. Regarding the weapons used by the attacker, 
the assistant director of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation mentioned only one, a hand-assembled firearm which was recovered near Anthony's body. These types of weapons, also known as ghost guns, are built by individuals, often using parts purchased online without any restrictions. Since they lack serial numbers, they are difficult to regulate and trace. Seeking to confirm this information, the Des Moines Register contacted Anthony's parents, who confirmed that their son had built his own weapon using information found online. They explained that he did it as a challenge rather than out of a specific desire to own a gun. They also emphasized that Anthony was very responsible and had never harmed another person or animal. Cecilia asserted that their family had never owned guns and that they had decided to acquire them due to the rising crime rates in Nebraska. She added that, due to their lack of experience, they even took classes to learn how to handle them. The parents explained that they brought the homemade gun on the trip for protection against crime and possibly bear attacks, as they had experienced one night while camping. They also mentioned their intention to dispose of it upon returning home. Anthony's parents set out to prove their son's innocence, convinced that he was a victim of homicide and not the killer. According to Anthony's mother, an independently obtained autopsy report indicated that he had been shot twice, not once as claimed by the police. She suspected that the first shot was meant to incapacitate him but she could not understand how he managed to shoot himself a second time, challenging the authorities' theory of suicide. Another point they raised was the color of the clothing the attacker was wearing. Cecilia recalled telling the 911 operator that the assailant was dressed in black, which did not match what her son was wearing, green shorts she had given him the day before the tragedy. Additionally, Cecilia and Joe reported that the police did not disclose where Anthony's body was found or whether the weapon he allegedly used to take his own life was the same one used against the Schmitz. When they specifically asked investigators if a ballistic test had been conducted to confirm matches, they received no answers. All these concerns were outlined in an email Cecilia sent to the media. In the message, she stated that her son had too many reasons to live and she was certain he would not abandon everything in such a manner. They had not seen any signs of him planning such an attack. In her opinion, Anthony was incapable of killing and had no connection to the Schmidt family. According to the grieving mother, the investigators only responded that it was a random murder. Anthony's parents requested the final investigation report to commission an independent review, but claimed they received no response to this request. In January 2023, a media outlet reported that it had requested public records of the case, adhering to Iowa's Open Records Law and the Freedom of Information Act. The request referenced incident reports, investigation documents, crime scene summaries, and autopsy reports. Devin McClone, from the Office of the Iowa Department of Public Safety Commissioner, responded that the requested records were not public and they could only share the immediate facts and circumstances of the case, which were included in the links provided in the press release. A few days later, the media outlet sent an email to the official inquiring whether the weapon Anthony used to take his own life matched the one used in the murders. She did not respond. Unless new evidence surfaces to the contrary, the police maintain that Anthony Sherwin was a random killer who viciously shot, stabbed, and strangled three beloved members of a Cedar Falls family. In contrast to Cecilia and Joe, their son, whom they described as a kind and studious individual, is innocent and another murder victim. They vowed to continue their efforts to prove his innocence. After his traumatic experience, Arlo, the only survivor of the massacre, was taken in by his family in Cedar Falls, specifically Sarah's brother. In an exclusive interview with a local newspaper, 
Sarah's brother stated that his nephew had been very brave and was in excellent mental health. The GoFundMe page created after the tragedy continues to receive donations to support Arlo's upbringing and to establish an educational fund for his future. On a quiet October afternoon in 2005, a tragic accident shattered the lives of everyone involved. 14-month-old Kyle Lazarkik was found unresponsive in his home, his tiny body marked with mysterious injuries. The young nanny, Ada Quadros, frantically dialed 911, but what happened next would change her life forever. As paramedics raced to the scene, the grim reality of Kyle's condition became evident. Despite Ada's desperate attempts to save him, the baby's injuries were severe. But what could have caused such a tragedy? The answers seemed elusive. Ada Quadros was born on September 13, 1977, in the coastal town of Chimbode, Peru. She was the first child of Victor Quadros, a veterinarian, and Luz Fernandez, a teacher. Ada was the eldest of four siblings and consistently excelled academically, even winning knowledge contests. She had a happy childhood filled with dreams of self-improvement. Ada later recounted that she spent much of her childhood with one of her sisters on their grandparents' farm, enjoying the close connection with nature and animals. This period was one of the happiest times of her life. Although Ada's family wasn't poor, they were not wealthy either. During her teenage years, she looked for ways to contribute financially. Together with her sister and a friend, she formed a group to entertain at children's parties. After high school, Ada enrolled in a private university to study law. Unfortunately, her financial situation did not allow her to continue, and she had to drop out. Despite this setback, Ada was determined to succeed and support her family. With this goal in mind, she applied for a U.S. visa through the lottery program. Like many young people from Peru and other Latin American countries, Ada saw the United States as a land of opportunities. She was determined to move there, work hard, earn a better income, and pave the way for a brighter future for herself and her family. Her family was thrilled for her. They sold some belongings and did everything possible to gather enough money for her journey. Her destination was Texas, where she initially planned to stay with some relatives. In early 2004, she began working as a waitress in a restaurant. After some time, she joined a company that placed nannies in households. This is how she met the Lazarkik family. The Lazarkik family consisted of Father Michael, commonly known as Mike, Mother Renee, their eldest daughter Alyssa, and twin boys Ryan and Kyle. Little is known about the family's background except that they married in 2000. Shortly after their wedding, Renee became pregnant with their first daughter, Alyssa. Just four months after Alyssa's birth, Renee was expecting again, this time with twins Kyle and Ryan. The Lazarkik couple wanted to hire a trustworthy nanny to take care of the twins when Renee returned to work. Elissa was already comfortable in a daycare she attended daily, where she had made several friends, so they decided she would continue going there. The couple interviewed several candidates, and Ada stood out as the best option. At 27 years old, she was young but not a teenager. She appeared healthy, strong, well-mannered and cheerful. Renee wanted Ada to start immediately so she could spend a few weeks with her, explaining the household routines, where things were, and what was expected of her. She also wanted to observe how Ada handled the young twins, who were just over a year old. The family had one specific request. They needed assurance that Ada could commit to staying with them for 18 months, and Ada committed to this arrangement. Initially, it was agreed that she would only spend the day at the Lazarkic household, but after some time, they asked her to live in, and Ada agreed. 
From then on, she only left on weekends to stay at her uncle's house. Everything seemed to go smoothly. The Lazarkic family was pleased with Ada's work and grew fond of her, trusting her completely. Numerous photos captured happy moments with the smiling young nanny holding the twins. However, everything changed in the summer of 2005. Ada informed the Lazarkic family that her uncles were returning to Peru before moving on to Germany. Ada was prepared to go with them and had already purchased her plane ticket for October 29th of that year. Understandably, this was disappointing news for the couple since it was not what they had agreed upon. Eventually, they understood and only asked Ada to stay until they could find a replacement. They even requested her help in searching for and selecting her successor. Ada agreed, but from that point on, she no longer stayed overnight at the Lazarkic home. Instead, she returned to her uncle's house each night and came back early in the morning. Given the change in circumstances and Ada's impending departure, the Lazarkic family scheduled interviews with several nanny candidates for Wednesday, October 12th. During the day, Renee called Ada and asked her to prepare macaroni and cheese for the children. Ada complied and fed the kids. When Renee returned home, she greeted her children, saw they were well, and after interviewing the candidates, spent over an hour with her little ones before they went to bed. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. However, at 5 a.m. on Thursday, October 13th, Kyle woke up crying, which was unusual. The twins were typically heavy sleepers and never woke up on their own. It always took someone to wake them. Nonetheless, Renee got up, went to the twins' room, picked up Kyle and soothed him until he fell back asleep. She then returned to bed. Two hours later, at 7.30, Mike went to the children's room, woke them up, hugged and kissed them, and left them in Ada's care before heading to work. Renee woke up just before 9.30 and spent some time with the twins. She changed Ryan's diaper, said goodbye to both him and Kyle, and left for work. The children were fine, with nothing out of the ordinary except Kyle's early wake-up. That day, their older sister Alyssa went to daycare as usual. But things took a dramatic turn around 1 p.m. when Ada called 911, highly agitated saying that one of the children, Kyle, had stopped breathing and was turning blue. After providing the address, the operator gave Ada instructions to perform CPR on the child. Ada followed the instructions while paramedics were on their way. A few minutes later, they arrived at the house and took over Kyle's care. They asked Ada what had happened and she, very distressed, explained that after lunch, she had put Kyle in his crib and returned to get his brother. But when she got back with Ryan, Kyle started vomiting and stopped breathing. While paramedics attended to Kyle, Ada called Renee to inform her of the situation, giving her a different version of events. She said that after feeding the children, she took Kyle out of his high chair and, as usual, placed him on the playroom floor while she fetched his brother. But when she returned, Kyle was vomiting. She went to the kitchen to get a bowl to catch the vomit, and when she returned, Kyle had fallen. She said she picked him up, took him to the sink, and performed the maneuver Renee had taught her in case one of the children stopped breathing. But it didn't work, and she also attempted CPR. After initial treatment, the paramedics transported Kyle to the nearest hospital when Renee arrived at the house. The ambulance with her son had already left, but the police were still at the scene. Renee took Ryan, the other twin, and asked Ada to accompany them. They followed the police, who escorted them to the hospital. During the drive, Renee called her husband and they met at the medical center. A few minutes later, the doctors decided to transfer Kyle by helicopter to the Dallas Children's Hospital. The Lazar Kicks returned home, left Ada to care for Ryan, and headed to the Dallas Children's Hospital. Ada asked them to keep her informed about Kyle's condition. On the way to the hospital, 
Renee started worrying that Ada might be too nervous to look after Ryan properly, so she called a friend to assist the nanny at the house. Shortly after, her friend arrived at the house. Ada, visibly distressed and crying, opened the door for her. She asked Ada to explain what had happened. According to her account, Ada said that Kyle was standing between the playroom and the kitchen when he suddenly collapsed. Ada claimed she dropped a plate she was holding, picked Kyle up, took him to the living room and performed CPR on him. She recalled Ada mentioning that Kyle's brain hadn't fully developed and that this issue had started at birth. She didn't fully understand, but Ada kept talking, saying she loved Kyle and would never hurt him. She tried to calm the very upset nanny, reassuring her that she hadn't done anything wrong and that she was a good person. Meanwhile, at the Dallas Children's Hospital, the Lazarkick family received devastating news. The doctor in charge of Kyle reported that the child had suffered severe head injuries with multiple bruises on his head, arm, and left shoulder. A neurosurgeon met with the distressed parents to explain that something had to be done to relieve the pressure on Kyle's brain, though survival was unlikely. A child abuse specialist who also met with Mike and Renee suggested that Kyle's injuries could be consistent with abuse. The specialist stated that Kyle's injuries were so severe, it was as if he had been in a car accident or fallen from a sixth floor. Initially, Renee couldn't believe it. She thought Ada might have accidentally dropped the child or was too scared or ashamed to admit it. But the doctors clearly explained the extent of Kyle's head injuries and the force required to cause them. With this information, the possibility of an accident seemed implausible. Renee immediately called another friend to pick up Ryan and take him away from the house. While this was happening at the hospital, Ada became increasingly anxious at home. Renee's friend had to leave to pick up her son from school and take him home. During her absence, Ada called her several times, asking if there was any news about Kyle. When Renee's friend returned to the house, she found Ada calm. Ada was no longer crying or talking. Shortly after, a police car drove by the house. Upon seeing it, Ada lost her composure. She began crying uncontrollably and shouting, No, no, no. She collapsed to the floor behind a door, repeatedly insisting she would never harm Kyle. Two female detectives arrived to interview Ada as the person who had called 911 about the injured child. She had been the only adult present when the incident occurred. As the detectives located the house and got out of their patrol car, they heard Ada's cries. Upon entering, they found her extremely agitated. When Ada was able to speak, she explained that she had taken Kyle out of his high chair and placed him on the playroom floor. She was patting his back to help him burp when he suddenly began to vomit. Ada said she went to the kitchen to get a container to catch the vomit, as Renee disliked stains on the floor. While she was cleaning, Kyle turned blue, fell, and started convulsing. She claimed she took him to the living room, called 911, and followed the dispatcher's instructions. During the interview, the other officer called the hospital to get an update on Kyle's condition. When they discovered the diagnosis, detectives told Ada that her story did not account for the injuries Kyle had. Ada suggested that Kyle might have hit his head when he fell after she left him alone in the playroom. But the officers noted that the playroom floor was covered with soft rugs, making this explanation unlikely. Trying to offer another explanation, Ada said that Kyle might have hit his head on the door frame when she carried him on her hip. At the officer's insistence, Ada demonstrated how Kyle could have been hurt and mentioned that Mike and Renee often bumped Kyle's head without any problems. The officer checked the spot where Ada claimed Kyle hit his head but found no evidence of a strong impact. When the officers told her that the injury didn't seem severe enough to cause the extensive damage the doctors described, Ada insisted that the impact was strong because she was running with Kyle in her arms. 
she also stated that she had never shaken or hit either of the twins. The officers urged Ada to tell the truth, as it could save Kyle's life, but Ada provided no further explanation. Given the circumstances, the officers reported the situation to their command and took Ada into preventive custody for further questioning. Meanwhile, crime scene investigation units arrived to examine the house. After completing their task, they informed Renee's friend, who had stayed at the house on behalf of the owners, that they could clean up and organize everything for the family's return. While several friends cleaned the house, they found a piece of adhesive tape sticking out from the door of a cabinet under the kitchen island. When they opened the door, they noticed it was broken and held together by tape. As a result, opening it caused the door to become misaligned. They simply placed it back and secured it with the tape, but found it strange because Renee was always careful with broken items to prevent the children from getting hurt. They had a hunch and called the police to report the door. Shortly after, investigators returned to collect potential evidence. Later, when questioned about the cabinet door, Renee stated that she frequently used that door and had never seen it held with adhesive tape. By Friday, October 14th, all of Mike and Renee's hopes had vanished. The doctors informed them that Kyle was brain dead and had no chance of recovery. Amid indescribable pain, the couple authorized the removal of life support, after which Kyle passed away. Three days later, on October 17th, the detectives interviewed Ada in prison, where she was accused of premeditated assault on a minor. This time, Ada claimed that the day before the incident, she was preparing the macaroni and cheese that Renee had requested. She had Kyle sitting on the kitchen counter, and the child fell, landing headfirst on the kitchen floor and hitting his head hard. Ada said she picked him up and checked for injuries. The only thing she noticed was redness on his ear and the right side of his head, so she applied cold compresses and gave him a pain reliever. When the interrogators asked why she hadn't told this to the other officers, Ada said she thought they wouldn't believe her. She mentioned that she didn't tell Renee because when she arrived home from work, she complained of a severe headache. Ada said Renee suffered from migraines and had requested that the lights be turned off and the house be kept quiet. The interrogators asked if she had fallen with the child, which she adamantly denied. During that interrogation, Ada learned that Kyle had died and she cried for the rest of the interview. Ada was brought before the courts where a judge charged her with aggravated homicide and set bail at $750,000, which was beyond the means of Ada or her family, so she remained in custody until the trial. At that time, the police indicated that she might be charged with premeditated actions, which could carry the death penalty. The case of Kyle's death went to trial in the second half of 2005. The doctor who examined Kyle at Dallas Children's Hospital testified that when he received Kyle, the child was already unconscious. He described multiple hematomas on the right side of Kyle's head, as well as bruises on the left side of his head and shoulder and both arms. Additionally, there were two small hemorrhages forming hematomas on the right temple. Kyle had three main areas of hematomas on his head indicating three separate impacts. He added that the bruises were relatively recent, one possibly 12 to 16 hours old. Internally, Kyle had brain and retinal bleeding, indicative of severe trauma, even though there were no broken bones. The brain tissue was notably swollen, and the pressure inside Kyle's head was 90 millimeters of mercury, whereas the normal level is 20 millimeters. Based on these findings, he be concluded that Kyle had suffered severe traumatic events consistent with blunt force trauma, possibly from someone hitting his head against a hard object. He suggested the type of injuries could result from shaking and swinging a young child's head against a solid object, like a kitchen cabinet door. 
A Dallas County forensic expert testified that the autopsy revealed multiple overlapping small hematomas on Kyle's scalp, along with a couple of punctate abrasions on the right temple, separated by over a centimeter. There were also four or five pairs of similar lesions on his head. His brain showed significant hemorrhage and swelling, with retinal hemorrhages in both eyes, requiring substantial force to cause such injuries. She concluded that the cause of death was severe head injuries from blunt force trauma, agreeing that Kyle's head might have been struck multiple times against the wooden door of the kitchen cabinet. She ruled out the possibility that Kyle had merely bumped into a door frame or fallen from the kitchen counter. Another critical testimony came from a forensic analyst who measured the distance between the fasteners on the broken kitchen cabinet door and found it matched the punctate abrasions on Kyle's head. This expert also analyzed the adhesive tape used to repair the cabinet door and discovered two DNA traces, one of which had a much higher contribution and matched Ada's DNA. The lesser trace could not be identified. After hearing from the experts, it was Mike's turn to testify. He stated that Kyle was fine on the night of October 12th and the morning of October 13th with no bruises. He also mentioned that he prepared breakfast that morning, opening and closing the kitchen cabinet doors to get utensils and food, and that all doors were in perfect condition, including the one later found inexplicably repaired with tape. The parents shared that they had breakfast with the children and played with blocks, with the twins crawling around a playhouse. Based on all the evidence, it was easy to conclude that the events leading to Kyle's death occurred when no other adults were in the house except Ada. The case prosecutor stated that the exact circumstances of what happened to Kyle might never be known for sure, but based on the evidence presented at trial, she painted a possible scenario. Perhaps Kyle didn't want to eat his lunch, and Ada, feeling frustrated or distracted by watching a soap opera, might have taken him out of his high chair without noticing the cabinet door was open. The prosecutor speculated that Ada's rage might have triggered the vicious attack on Kyle's head using the cabinet door until it broke, with the door's screws leaving marks on the child. After all the testimonies and closing arguments, the jury went to deliberate. Upon returning, they found Ada Quadros guilty of capital murder of a child under six years old. As the verdict was read, Ada's mother, Luz Fernandez, who had traveled from Peru when her daughter was arrested, stood up and shouted that she would free Ada because she was innocent. She proclaimed that there was no evidence to convict her daughter and vowed to start over an appeal. After the jury members left, Kyle's parents showed photographs and videos of their deceased son, recounting his brief 14 months of life from birth to the last photo taken days before his death. Family members spoke about Kyle, while others simply couldn't stop crying. Ada was sentenced the following year in 2006 to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. For Ada and her family, giving up was not an option. Her parents immediately started a campaign to appeal the sentence, arguing that Ada's conviction was based on racial prejudice and ineffective public defense. However, appealing required money for legal representation and process costs, which the family did not have. Undeterred, they sought support from various sources, including the Peruvian government, the Peruvian and Latino communities in the United States, and solidarity organizations in Peru. In prison, Ada maintained her innocence and took every opportunity for interviews to assert it. Their persistence paid off, and in 2009, Ada's legal representation filed an appeal citing five specific errors in the initial trial. After reviewing the case, the appeals court dismissed three of the claims but agreed with two. This was enough for the judges to overturn the conviction and annul the trial due to irregularities. Following this decision, 
Ada's family began another fundraising effort to cover the $100,000 needed for a new trial. It took another three years to prepare for the new trial, which began on July 10, 2012, with the selection of 12 jurors from over 100 candidates. The trial took place in Collin County's Justice Hall. The defense argued that Kyle had fallen from the kitchen counter on October 12th, injuring his head, and the situation worsened the next day when Ada, running with the child in her arms, accidentally struck his head on the doorframe. This time, the defense presented testimony from a forensic expert with 40 years of experience. He suggested that some of Kyle's bruises might have been caused at the hospital during catheter insertion to assess brain swelling. The prosecution fiercely challenged this testimony. David Gardner, an employee of the kitchen cabinet manufacturer, also testified for the defense. He proposed alternative explanations for the broken cabinet door, though he didn't entirely rule out that Kyle's head could have been struck against it. A poignant moment in the trial was Mike's testimony, where he described Kyle's last two days connected to numerous tubes and machines, eventually being taken off life support and dying in his parents' arms. The defense argued there wasn't enough evidence to convict Ada, but the prosecution highlighted the medical findings and the numerous times Ada changed her story. After the sessions concluded, the jury deliberated for five hours, even requesting to listen to the 911 call recordings again. Ultimately, they once again found Ada Quadros, then 33, guilty of capital murder and sentenced her to life imprisonment without parole. Back in prison, Ada joined the prison volleyball team, learned Braille, and won an art contest with a drawing of the Virgin Mary, which she auctioned to raise funds for a new appeal. Ada, from her cell, maintains her innocence, her spirit unbroken as she and her family continue their fight for an appeal, seeking a chance to prove what they believe to be the truth. Can you tell me what a lie is? It's not the truth. Can you tell me what the truth is? It's not a lie. Okay. Um, if I told you your mother was in the courtroom here today, would that be the truth? No, so. That would not be the truth. Why is that? Because she's not in the courtroom? No, so. Okay. Where is your mother? Jail. AJ? So. When is the last time that you saw your mother? Do you remember? No, so. Has it been a long time? Yes, so. That woman sitting right there between them. Have you ever seen her before? Yes, so. Who is that? My mother. Now you recognize your mother? Yes, so. Hey, James. Hey, James. Yes, so. Give me your hand. All right. Details about the early life of Amanda Lewis are scarce, but it is known that she was born in the early 1980s. Her mother, Brenda, raised her in Alabama, USA. At some point, Brenda married a man named Charles Burns, who became Amanda's stepfather and was actively involved in her upbringing. Amanda described herself as a restless, talkative, and sometimes problematic child who often struggled to follow rules. These traits might have contributed to her becoming a mother at the young age of 15. Unfortunately, her early motherhood ended in tragedy when her baby, Alex, died at 16 months old from a seizure disorder. Amanda recounted that on the day Alex passed away, she had left him sleeping while she took a bath. When she returned, she found him not breathing and rushed him to the emergency room, but it was too late. Later, while still in Alabama, 
Amanda entered what seemed to be a stable relationship resulting in the birth of two children, Adriana Elaine Hutto and Andrew Jordan Hutto. Adriana was born on September 16, 1999, and his younger brother, Andrew, affectionately known as AJ, followed about a year later. Despite sharing the same last name, many sources indicate that the kids were half-brothers with different fathers. After the relationship ended, Amanda relocated with her children to a small community called Esto in Florida. Esto, a town of approximately 360 residents, had historically relied on the timber industry and more recently, agriculture and manufacturing. It also attracted tourists seeking natural beauty and tranquility. Amanda quickly adapted to her new environment, appreciating the peace and basic amenities it offered. She trained as a nursing assistant and secured a job at a nearby care and rehabilitation center, which provided her with stability. Despite the semblance of a stable life with a steady job, a simple home and her two children, Amanda faced significant challenges. Her eldest daughter, Adriana, who was seven at the time, was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. ADHD is a common neurodevelopmental disorder in children, characterized by difficulties in maintaining attention, impulsivity, and high levels of activity. Amanda found it challenging to form a close and calm relationship with Adriana, who required medication to manage her symptoms. The difficulties with Adriana contrasted with her relationship with AJ, which seemed to be less strained. She got along well with him as he was a calm child who could spend hours playing with his toy tractors. The contrast between the siblings' personalities was striking. Adriana required more attention both at home and at school, where the teachers were aware of her condition. However, this did not prevent Amanda from being called in on several occasions because her daughter had gotten into fights with other classmates, used foul language, or caused some sort of trouble. Additionally, Adriana occasionally wet her pants. Despite these setbacks, her teacher noted that her behavior was improving, and she was a smart girl who loved to read. At home, Adriana displayed the same behaviors, leading Amanda to frequently resort to time out as a form of punishment. This practice involves removing the misbehaving child from the area where the incident occurred, placing them in a separate spot, and leaving them alone to calm down and, if possible, reflect on their actions. However, as Amanda later admitted, not all moments were reflective. On some occasions, she used physical punishment to curb her daughter's misbehavior. At some point, Amanda met a new partner, a young man named Alan Carnley, who also came from Alabama. He had just come out of a failed relationship, from which he had two children. It appears that Alan's breakup was amicable, as there were no custody issues, and his children frequently visited and spent time with him and his new family. The events that unfolded in the summer of 2007 would change their lives forever. The family lived in a refurbished trailer on a spacious plot of land. That summer was particularly hot in Florida, so Alan decided to buy a pool to help beat the heat. The pool provided an opportunity for family fun, as his kids were also visiting at the time. The pool excited everyone, and the couple set strict rules for Amanda's younger children, prohibiting them from using it without an adult present. Amanda even removed the ladder to prevent the kids from accessing the pool unsupervised, storing it in the shed to eliminate any temptation. On Wednesday, August 8, 2007, early in the morning, Amanda returned home exhausted after a night shift at work. Eager to catch up on lost sleep, she decided to take a nap before starting the day's family activities, which included shopping for school supplies. That morning, the kids woke up and, according to Amanda, didn't want breakfast. After saying goodbye to her partner as he left for work, she left the kids watching cartoons on TV. 
One of Alan's sons, who was also in the house, was woken up by his father but was too sleepy to stay awake. He barely heard Adriana and AJ arguing before dozing off again. He heard them yelling, but it was nothing out of the ordinary, so he went back to sleep. According to Amanda's later account, she woke up sometime before noon and began tidying up the house before heading out with her children to shop for school supplies. Since they would have to wait a bit, she suggested that the kids go outside to play while she finished her chores. At one point, AJ came into the house to tell her that Adriana was in the pool. Initially, this didn't alarm her. She assumed her daughter was just playing near the pool. She instructed AJ to call Adriana and have both kids come back inside. Amanda then went back into the house, picked up her cell phone, and called her partner. She was talking to Alan while walking towards the window overlooking the pool. Everything changed when she saw AJ standing on a ladder at the edge of the pool, splashing his hands in the water. Amanda immediately ran outside, pulled her son away from the pool's edge, and was horrified to see Adriana floating face down in the water, her skin blue and lifeless. She described how she stretched her arms from the poolside, grabbed her daughter's feet, and pulled her out of the water. Once she had Adriana in her arms, she laid her on the grass, face up. The phone call with Alan was still active, and she screamed to him what had happened. Alan instructed her to call 911. As emergency personnel arrived, Amanda began performing CPR on Adriana, relying on her training as a nurse, although she admitted she had never had to use those skills in a real-life situation until then. The first responders on the scene were firefighters, with Unit Chief Charles taking over the resuscitation efforts as they awaited the arrival of medical and police teams. Their efforts seemed to yield some results. Adriana showed faint signs of life. Given the severity of Adriana's condition and the lack of advanced medical facilities in the small town of Esto, she was airlifted, accompanied by her mother, to the nearest hospital. Amid all the commotion, Alan's son woke up and, looking out the window, saw the frantic efforts to revive his stepsister. Before leaving, Amanda shouted to him to take care of his half-brother, AJ, and bring him inside. Later, the police contacted Amanda's children's grandparents to come and pick up AJ. Upon arriving at the hospital, the emergency doctor immediately took over Adriana's care, with a team working intensively to stabilize her and restore her vital signs. For a moment, it seemed they had succeeded. Adriana had a pulse. Tragically, after nearly an hour of effort, they lost the battle. Adriana, seven years old, was pronounced dead at 5.05 that afternoon. Amanda later recounted that when she was told her daughter had passed, she felt her stomach churn. She was allowed to see Adriana one last time, kissing and hugging her, knowing it would be their final goodbye. In the eyes of the doctors, emergency staff, and police, it was a tragic accident, much like many others involving young children and bodies of water such as pools. While it was a tragic event, it could have easily marked the end of the story. However, Miles away from the hospital where Adriana was declared deceased, her younger brother, AJ, left everyone stunned with a shocking account. Upon arriving at his grandparents' house, as they tried to calm him down, the little boy suddenly said that his mother had drowned Adriana. Naturally, upon hearing such a statement, Brenda and Charles, Amanda's mother and stepfather, were completely shocked and bewildered. The couple talked with the boy for a while, thinking he might have misunderstood something, but after asking him some questions and finding his answers convincing, they decided to take AJ to the police station to speak with the officers. With the grandparents' permission, AJ was questioned by the police, during which he stated that his mother had held his sister underwater as a punishment. According to the boy's account that morning, Adriana had taken a bottle of window cleaner and sprayed it all over the living room, the curtains, and the TV. 
AJ continued saying that when his mother discovered what had happened, she became very angry, dragged her seven-year-old daughter to the pool, put her in it, and held her head under the water until she stopped moving. This story was repeated multiple times during two interviews with investigators and a third with a child expert. Although several aspects of the boy's story varied across the different interviews, the claim that his mother had submerged his sister's head underwater remained consistent. As a result, the authorities launched an investigation, starting with a thorough inspection of the house where the incident occurred. During this search, several things became evident. The bedroom shared by AJ and his sister was in disarray with a broken bunk bed, complete disorganization, and a strong smell of urine. The word neglect echoed in the investigators' minds. Aside from the neglect, what shocked the detectives the most was the lack of toys in a room shared by two children. Naturally, Amanda was summoned to the police station to provide a statement and respond to her son's accusations. She appeared astonished and vehemently denied that her son's account had any truth to it. When confronted with the results of the house inspection, she explained that there were few toys in the children's room because she had thrown out the broken ones and donated the rest as a punishment for Adriana's bad behavior. As for the overwhelming smell of urine, she had no choice but to acknowledge it, explaining that Adriana often wet the bed. The investigators requested that Amanda undergo a polygraph test. She agreed immediately and successfully passed the test. However, her situation was further complicated by the autopsy results on her daughter's body. The post-mortem examinations confirmed that the cause of death was drowning, but they also revealed clear signs of assault on the girl's face. There were visible bruises that covered nearly the entire face and closely matched the size of an adult hand. With this evidence on September 5, 2007, Amanda was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, facing the possibility of a life sentence or even the death penalty. The proceedings to prepare the case for trial began immediately. Although the authorities offered Amanda a plea deal, which would have required her to plead guilty to manslaughter in exchange for a 10-year sentence, she refused and chose to face trial for the charge against her. In the months leading up to the trial, investigators scrutinized all of AJ's statements to ensure that the young boy was not fabricating or confusing events. During interviews, they asked him questions such as what he was watching on TV that day and what other events occurred. He mentioned cartoons airing at that time, a helicopter flying overhead and tree-cutting activities near his house to protect power lines. All these events were verified showing that A.J. remembered the day perfectly. Investigators also conducted interviews with family members, neighbors, co-workers, educators, and first responders who arrived at Amanda's house following the 911 call. The goal was to understand the family dynamics and ascertain the truth of what had happened. One of the interviewees was the doctor who had informed Amanda of Adriana's death. The doctor noted that Amanda's reaction to the tragic news was peculiar, as she showed no signs of grief. Instead, she asked where the vending machine was. With all the evidence gathered, the case went to trial on February 9, 2008. Over the next four days, Amanda's fate would be decided. Witnesses for both the prosecution and the defense took the stand. Authorities who responded to Amanda's emergency call in August 2007 described the dramatic scene they encountered, seeing Adriana clinging to life before she ultimately passed away. Testimonies were also heard from Alan and his children, who spoke about the family dynamics and details of the day in question. Amanda's boyfriend recounted what he heard while on the phone with Amanda during the incident. Alan's son had little to contribute as he had been asleep all morning and only emerged after the commotion began. Alan's daughter wasn't present on the day of the incident, but she narrated an earlier event at her aunt Amanda's pool. 
She described Amanda trying to teach Adriana to swim despite the child's terror, at one point threatening to let her go. She also stated that she often supervised the children while Amanda slept, witnessing Adriana being punished by being confined to a room for an entire day. Testimonies from Amanda's co-workers were particularly damning. They recounted an instance when Amanda, furious, brought Adriana to the nursing home, repeatedly saying she would gladly take her life. These harsh words spoken in front of the child were seen as inappropriate and cruel by her colleagues. On that particular morning, Adriana had taken a marker from Amanda's car and scribbled all over the interior, even writing loser in one spot. The trial highlighted how Adriana's ADHD had prevented Amanda from forming a positive relationship with her, but two testimonies stood out, those of Amanda and her son, AJ. As we saw at the beginning, AJ, after six months of not seeing his mother, took a while to recognize her and cried when he did. During her testimony on the stand, Amanda acknowledged that her daughter's behavioral problems had made their relationship difficult. She described Adriana as extroverted and hyperactive, noting that she was very much like herself, stubborn and always by her side. Amanda claimed that Adriana sometimes displayed violent behavior, recalling an incident where the girl threatened her younger brother with a sharp kitchen tool. Amanda also admitted that she had once placed Adriana in a specialized institution for six days. She confessed to the court that she might not have loved her daughter as much as she should have. Amanda stated that she often punished Adriana by confining her to her room, the same smelly and dirty room that shocked the investigators. She also took away most of the toys as a punishment for leaving them scattered around. Amanda admitted that she occasionally lost her temper and would slap or spank Adriana, such as during the incident when Adriana had written on the car with a marker. Amanda described how Adriana had just begun learning to swim, could move her arms and legs a bit, but was terrified of putting her head underwater. Amanda insisted that she was not teaching Adriana to submerge her head. When asked if she knew how to swim, Amanda replied that she did. Sticking to her version of events, Amanda admitted that when AJ told her Adriana was in the pool, she didn't immediately check on her. Instead, she called her partner and only looked out the window later. She saw AJ at the pool's edge trying to reach Adriana, who was splashing in the water. That was when, according to her, she rushed to help but was already too late. Amanda's defense argued that Adriana's death was a tragic accident. They claimed that the girl had pushed her brother's toy cart to the pool's edge, climbed on it, and used a tray to scoop out insects from the water. When she leaned over, the edge of the inflatable pool gave way and Adriana fell in. During the trial, the prosecution questioned Amanda about how she had pulled Adriana out of the pool. Amanda admitted that she hadn't given her daughter breakfast or her medication that morning, claiming that Adriana had said she didn't feel well. It later emerged that neither child had eaten breakfast or lunch by the time of the incident around midday. Another critical piece of testimony came from the autopsy report on Adriana. The original forensic specialist did not testify as he had been dismissed for negligence in over 30 autopsies. Instead, the director of investigations at the medical examiner's office explained the autopsy process and findings, emphasizing the bruises on Adriana's face. Amanda's defense strongly challenged this testimony, questioning whether the marks were definitively from a hand. The expert had to admit that she couldn't be absolutely certain. Then came the pivotal moment in the trial, AJ's testimony. In a lengthy and exhausting interrogation for a seven-year-old, AJ recounted the events he had described many times before to investigators. This time, he included a drawing he had made during psychological support sessions, illustrating what had happened. After his long testimony, AJ faced cross-examination from Amanda's defense, 
who pressed him until he became visibly confused and tired, giving contradictory answers. Despite this, the prosecution deemed him a credible witness, supported by other significant details, such as the fact that Adriana was tall enough to stand in the pool and easily lift her head above the water. With these elements, the trial proceeded, culminating in a dramatic and crucial phase where the truth about Adriana's death hung in the balance. In the end, while the defense argued that Adriana's tragic death was a very unfortunate accident, the prosecution maintained that Amanda had maliciously punished her daughter. The prosecution argued that Amanda had reached her breaking point due to immense stress and exhaustion, having tried numerous ways to discipline her daughter, none of which seemed effective. In a moment of overwhelming frustration, Amanda snapped. After all testimonies concluded, the jury deliberated for only two hours, including lunch, before returning with a verdict. They found Amanda Lewis guilty of first-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. The following month, during the sentencing hearing, the judge issued a life sentence plus an additional 30 years for aggravated child abuse. Amanda has attempted several appeals, none of which have been successful. She remains incarcerated at Lowell Correctional Institution. Reports following the trial's conclusion indicated that A.J. was cared for by his grandparents in the months after the incident. However, once the judicial process was complete, A.J. was reportedly put up for adoption. Since then, his life has been kept private. By 2024, A.J. would be 24 years old and we can only hope that his life has been significantly better than how it began.